Hello and welcome to NAB Show from Office Hours global we're really excited this is day three uh, and we've got a jam-packed show hopefully you've seen the previous two days or kind of scrub through that on youtube if you missed it you would have seen some highlights um, we've got lots to get to so what i want to do is uh is just quickly say hello to the four panelists that we have um that you've seen before so we have courtney from uh hollywood california good morning or hello down there in australia Thank you. Yes, I'm down in Adelaide, Australia. And then we go across to Seattle, Washington with Guy Cochran. Hey, good afternoon from Seattle, Washington, where it's actually sunny, but it was raining this morning, so I get a little mix. There you go. Uh, Guy is getting paid twice because he's running four cameras as well. Um, and then we have Ronnie Hov um, Hofse um, from Tomsi, um, Tromsey in Norway. Hey, hey. Yeah, we're uh, we're coming in from the other other side of the northern hemisphere, and we'd like That's to right. just uh, thank everyone for being here with us. And we're covering off uh, a few continents across the ditch. Uh, we've got Adrian Watkins in Wellington, New Zealand. Hello, sir. We're in all, and good morning. Uh, here we go for day three. Looking forward to an awesome show. Very cool. All right, so I want to get straight into it. What's super exciting is we've been talking about how Zoom has been our connection partner, um, making it all possible by by providing the bandwidth that we're using because uh, we have a booth right there in Vegas, um, and and Zoom has been helping us with a whole bunch of different things. And we've got Andy with us to uh, to talk to us all about it. Hey, Andy, how are you? It, it's super cool. So um, could you give us a little, uh, like yesterday, there was just all these announcements that were coming out, um, lots of things that were happening all at once. So can you give us kind of a rundown of what Zoom announced yesterday? Including Zoom OSC and Zoom ISO, bringing a lot of features that were heavily requested by our community, including office hours as well. So. Zoom ISO now supports stereo audio, shared audio. It adds support for AJA video devices. It adds support for Symphony 2110 through Blackmagic desktop video and other uh, kind of quality of life fixes and improvements that we've gotten through community uh, testing and, and work from our customers' word back that's come to our team. And we're really excited to take that next step. The Zoom Meeting SDK is also updated to support AV1 decoding. So as the Zoom platform continues to adopt uh, AV1 in different areas and facets, Zoom ISO will be able to take advantage of that uh, as part of the new update as well. Uh, in Zoom OSC, we added a transcription output. So uh, we have AI uh, real-time translated captions in Zoom. We actually use this at our own Zoomtopia event. We had French and German captions on screen for people who needed that interpretation. And what's cool about it is that Zoom can generate the captions and now Zoom OSC can extract that and send it to a media server so we can have branded and configurable uh, display of those captions uh, versus just burned in you know, uh, white on black text or some, um, something like that. So that's over on the Liminal app side. Um, the other big news that we had with Liminal was that we're now uh, including uh, Zoom OSC and Zoom ISO in the Zoom Events platform. Um, so we've heard from our enterprise customers that user-based licensing is really, really helpful uh, as they scale up their organization's needs. And so the ability now to sign into Zoom ISO, for example, with a Hubhost account on Zoom Events and automatically activate to Pro instead of having to manage a device-based license, uh, it's much more ergonomic for our customers and we're really excited to introduce that as uh, kind of fleshing out the platform, if you will, for uh, professional production uh, when you have to scale up. Maybe it's for hybrid, maybe it's for broadcast, but these tools can really be helpful to you there. Um, our Zoom apps have also been updated. Our live streaming app has the ability now to uh, discover a stream. If you scheduled it first on YouTube, you'll now find that and you can kind of pair with it. That was a workflow thing that we thought was really helpful as people have all different ways of going live and also being able to embed the interpretation audio is something that uh, you'll see soon in that app. So really, really excited about that. Um, we worked with Ecamm, so I know maybe, maybe some Ecamm Live users out in the audience. Uh, they've adopted our SDKs and are now available in our uh, Zoom app marketplace, and soon that will be available to you in a beta of the Ecamm software, and Zoom will be directly integrated to pull in the remote guests and manage everything uh, directly from the Ecamm software. So super, super excited to work with that team. Um, Liminal also published the Unreal Engine integration that we used for our own Zoomtopia project. So back on March 25th, we announced the SDK, 
and it has a sample project and it's kind of a hello world, just getting started. And in fact, the, the setup that we have here at the booth is based on that sample project for me to be able to see all of you. What we've done is we took the project that we built for Zoomtopia and now we've made that available as well. So if you're looking for a more complex example, something more fleshed out, 32 video tiles floating in space with reactions and flip animations and all that stuff, plus all the sequencer stuff that we talked about back in October on office hours, you can now download and check out that project yourself. Um, but maybe the, um, as we get more into like the, the hardcore AV side of things, uh, which we're using to great effect here at the booth, uh, Zoom Rooms Pro AV. That allows us to connect in uh, professional equipment, very similar to how Zoom ISO interacts, but bring that over into more of the appliance form factor in the Zoom Rooms product. So we can capture here uh, the four Sony FR7s. Uh, those are coming in through SDI into a DeckLink Duo, and that's being all passed in through one Zoom Room at 1080p30 back into the meeting that you're in right now. So that's how uh, the remote TDs are able to switch the cameras that are here at the booth is using our Pro AV uh, software. And then finally, I want to talk about tiles, and I imagine there's probably quite a few questions about that. Um, but tiles is a way of building configurable gallery views uh, by pulling in the remote video feeds and compositing it right there on device. So if you think about the spectrum, right, you've got uh, maybe uh, Unreal Engine doing like the super high-end 3D integration is really complex, but very powerful. But for the person who just needs to be able to display a gallery view in either a hybrid auditorium space or maybe flanking uh, uh, the main screen of a teleconferencing system and just bring a little bit more branding and style to that, Tiles is designed to make that a whole lot easier. Um, so we're really excited to introduce, introduce that into the liminal suite of tools. And I actually have a demo of that available when you're ready. We can take a look at maybe building a custom gallery view together that we can look at as well. So that's the high level again. Plenty of, we can get into in more detail, but uh, we've been very busy as you've seen. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. I'll let you take a breath because uh, it didn't. It seemed like you didn't take a breath for a few minutes there as you went through, which is so amazing. It, there's lots of great stuff there, um, and we're particularly interested, um, as you've said about even what we're using right at the booth. It's really impressive. Um, can can you tell us a little bit because I I know in some in some other uh, shows you have been exhibiting, having a booth and showing kind of like the, the Zoom Rooms Pro AV um, set up and things. Um, it, it sounds like you've made a really intentional choice at NAB to partner, uh, particularly with office hours, and just show it off in, in sort of real time. Is that, is that the, the way you've gone about it? That's absolutely right. We think it, you know, it's something very authentic about working directly with a partner uh, who uses our tools every day and being able to supplement what they're doing and amp that up. I think it makes a, a much more um, engaging experience for us for this type of audience with these type of announcements. So that's been really exciting. And, and for me personally, like, to come to the booth and see, oh, we, you know, we have a, a connection issue and we need to figure out how to get these cameras back into Zoom and then be able to just throw in Pro AV Zoom rooms and suddenly that works. Or, oh, we need to be able to find a, a way that maybe has a little more style and control for how to have the guests sitting here at the table see our remote guests and frame them around a camera and be able to pull out Unreal Engine and make that possible. Or something else, you know, we need to be able to pull something in with Zoom ISO or we want to use the multi-speaker view as part of Zoom Workplace when we're doing our interview rig to make you guys more interactive with the panel that's there. It's been so uh, interesting for me to sort of dog food our own technology to solve mm -hmm. the problems of coverage at this event. I think there's, again, there's a certain authenticity to that. It's something we're very intentional about. And we're really excited to work with you guys on this show. It's been so exciting. That's so good. Yeah. So just so we get some of the nomenclature right, um, I, there, was a, there was a shift in the client that everyone uses now uh, to Zoom Workplace. And I think that that's kind of focusing it in on what that's about. Is that right? And, and moving to version six as well, right? That's right. So Zoom version six, uh, henceforth, we're calling our client the Zoom Workplace client. And what's exciting about Workplace is that it really brings together all of the collaboration tools that Zoom has together. We're probably all most familiar with meetings here, and we've certainly refreshed that experience. If you've downloaded it already, you've seen the new multi-speaker view, the wallpapers, the, um, the different layout controls, the new sharing experience, right? There's, so there's plenty of things that speak to that core meeting competency. We've also tied in together all the other, especially the asynchronous communication tools. And then the back plane sitting on top of all of that is AI Companion. And the way that, that weaves the entire business lifecycle together through our software. Uh, it really is a place where you can get all your work done and get it done efficiently because AI's got your back on that while still having a really high quality uh, AV experience uh, for meetings. So it, it's a huge initiative for us. It's one of the biggest updates we've ever done. There's been a lot of really interesting press about that and it's available now. So uh, again, that kind of uh, interesting timing with, uh, with NAB and we've put that out as well. So something everybody can go check out and enjoy. Yeah, that's great. And for people that are geeking out at home, when we're particularly, you'll see later when we do our wireless uh, link through to the 
to the vendors and the, some of the booths and we're talking to them, what they're seeing is a screen just above the lens of the camera where they're seeing multi-speaker mode, the new in, in version six, um, where they're able to see the active speaker. It's kind of a, it's kind of a hybrid of, of gallery view and active speaker, right, Andy? So it's kind of like it, it starts moving up and it's a little bit more creative in that if someone else is talking, then you're kind of almost automatically pinning. Is that a, is that a way to say it? That's right. Yeah, it's not it's not pinning as you'd think of it as the feature of pinning, but the end visual result is very much similar. So, like you said, it's kind of like you took speaker view and gallery view and put them together, and it gives us the ability to have emphasis while still having the ability to see everybody. And I think that's a, a very uh, happy medium where you want to be able to follow the conversation a little more easily, but you still want to be able to see the reactions that everybody else has to that conversation. And this helps balance that. And it's very configurable. You can drag and drop. You can set well do all the things that you would imagine. You know, from customizing with Zoom and all the layouts, but um, but we think it's just a nice blending, and it, we've seen people say that it's, it's their new favorite view in Zoom, so we're really excited to roll that out. Super cool. Hey, Courtney, we've got a couple of questions there. Yeah, we got one coming in from uh, Roland Booth uh, from uh, Kingston, Jamaica, and he says, uh, when is the Zoom OSC update for Windows coming? The Mac OS version is now at 4.4.0, but the Zoom OSC remains at 4.3.0 for Windows, and he says he loves that tool. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, and, and thank you for being a user. Uh, we have some more information about um, other updates that we'll be making, uh, particularly around the Windows platform, uh, to come. But uh, just to emphasize that, you know, as we've continued to roll out new tools such as Unreal Engine, which has all those hooks that Zoom OSC has, we are continuing to invest in Windows-based development tools. And I think Unreal Engine, like I said, is a great example of that. Pro AV Zoom Rooms, which is cross-platform, another good example of that as well. We'll have more information to share on next steps specifically for Zoom OSC soon, uh, but for now, now, the 4.4 release, as you observed, is uh, exclusive to the Mac OS version right now. Uh, and we'll have, like I said, more, more details to come on that, but we're continuing to invest in features on the Windows platform, uh, and we'll share more information about that soon. Next question. Okay, comes in from, uh, well, I guess this is more of a generic question. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me, Kyle Hammond uh, from Chicago, Illinois says, uh, what is the feature with all those rollouts do you think will sneak past people. Uh, what should we not sleep on? Yeah, I think I think that tiles is going to be something really interesting to take a look at because we've seen, you know, the journey with tiles started with our own needs for our own events. So we started by using Zoom ISO and a media server to create a customized view. If any of you watched Jonathan's behind the scenes, he talked about Mona mode at Zoomtopia 2022, where he laid out like the Mona Lisa 15 different times and created a custom view uh, in Isadora to, to do that. and. We, we definitely understood the need to show our audience at our own event. But um, scaling that kind of workflow to enterprise or, or making that available to sort of the, the solopreneur video production team, that's pretty hard to do. Um, so what we, what we thought about was how do we take the learnings from that experience and, and productize that and build something new that um, allows you to do that much more easily. Now, certainly we have the Unreal Engine tools. We're continuing, as you saw, support Zoom ISO. So you can still do the more complex builds, but for something that needed to be a little more simple while still infinitely customizable, that's where Tiles comes in. And I actually have a demo of Tiles if we could take a minute on that. So I'm going to- Yeah, let's, um, let's yeah, do that now, Andy. That. That'd be great. So let's go over to my screen, and I'm going to open up the Tiles app here. And I must admit that this is perhaps a bit of a fool's errand to try to demo this live from the booth, but I'm going to take a shot at it anyway. So what I have here is the editor panel, and there's a couple of debugging things on screen, but generally speaking, you start with this grid, and we want to maybe make some modifications to this. So first, maybe I'm not going to show 16 people on screen at once. So I can start bumping that down, and let's say uh, maybe six is where we want to be. But they're kind of oddly spaced now because the left and right are going right up to the edge, but the middle, uh, top and bottom are a little different. So I'm going to increase the amount of spacing that I have between those. And just for the sake of argument, if I had seven, but I wanted to put a bug in the bottom, I could snap that left row, over, snap the bottom row over to the left side, but I'll, I'll leave that at center for now. And I can pre-visualize this with any additional number of participants. So maybe the max number is going to be seven, but we might only have three, so I can see how that's going to look at various different sizes. But we'll go ahead and lock that in at six. Um, we can choose the resolution of the participants that are composing this view. So right now at the top, you can see I've got 1920 by 1080, so I'm gonna leave them at 360p for now. But if this were a 4K output, I might wanna bump that resolution up to get more of the fidelity. I'm gonna set a canvas color, so I'm gonna open up this little color picker here, and I'm gonna set this to maybe like a, this kind of blue color over here. 
and then we're going to go down and do some additional customization to each individual tile. So looking top to bottom, we defined our canvas, we defined how the tiles are going to be laid out, now we're going to design the tiles themselves. I like the um, rounded rectangle look, but I think that maybe a five by four will be more appropriate because it'll fill the screen a little bit more. I'm going to increase the corner radius as well so we can really observe that rounded corner effect. And I'm going to add a border here. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it white, but what I might do is I might pop the opacity down so it's semi-transparent on top of the tile itself, which will be clear in a moment. But I'm also going to turn on a shadow, a drop shadow here. So I'm going to increase the shadow radius a little bit. And I'll set the X and Y for it so that it kind of dips over the bottom right edge. And so now you've saw just in a few seconds here, we've created a customized gallery view that we're going to be able to use for our event. And we can define multiple displays as well. If I go over to the outputs tab, now here's the output. I have this connected into a meeting right now. And so you can see there's that, you know, that border that's kind of that, that nice highlighted color around. You can see the semi-transparency there. But in this meeting, I actually have more people than I have on screen. So I had this idea of a queue. And what's, what's cool about the queue is that it allows us to favorite, block, or otherwise moderate the people who are coming up on stage. So as a solo operator, I can focus my attention just on who's up next. So for the sake of demo, I'm going to just decrease the timer here to three seconds. This will be a little fast, but I think it'll get the idea. So in three seconds, a new participant will rotate on screen. And we could set animations for that, like scale or flip or other things like that. But we're going to rotate through. And, and let's say that. Um, that this video here, I want to favorite that because he's maybe one of my, my primary audience members. But this video here I don't like as much, so I'm going to just go ahead and block that. So now it's not in my queue anymore. It's not part of my rotation. And the, the video feed that I favorited is never going to leave. I can look at all my participants as well, and I can moderate and see, OK, who's on stage? Where are they? Uh, I see that I blocked Luke here. If I, if I regret that decision, uh, I can go and unblock them there, and they'll go back up on my display rotation. I can see who's unassigned, who I haven't dealt with. I've also set some filters so my, um, my host and co-host can still be on screen, but my non-video participants in this meeting are automatically excluded. Also myself is excluded. But if we made like all of our crew co-hosts, we could exclude them from the rotation as well. And then once we've done all that, well, what do we do with it? Well, in this case, we're going to send it over NDI, uh, and we can make that available to a downstream media server or some other tool that can then pull this in and help us manage the experience. So again, you kind of think of those three stages of like joining the meeting, designing the experience, and then creating a customized bespoke output. Um, so we're super, super excited about this tool and uh, look forward to getting it in your hands very soon. Dude, I'm, I'm floored, speechless. It's so, so cool. That's like things that we've been trying to, you know, create ourselves and we, we end up, you know, we end up trying to bring a gallery view in and then overlay a bunch of things to try to cover up things. And so um, <clears throat> that is amazing. What, what kind of other limitations? Like how, how many, did you say sort of 16 you could go to is the tops on well, the screen? Or? Well, we can do actually quite a bit more. So if I go back to my oh. editor here, um, I'm actually going to turn off my outputs for a moment, and we're going to go into pre-visualization mode, and I'm going to create just a ton of them. So I'm going to go max participants. Here's like 30, I think, oh, and I can dude. still pre-visualize what that's going to look like at different sizes. But of course, now this is a little bit of a nonsensical look. So maybe what I want to do here is instead of rounded rectangles, go to a circle that's one by one. So a one by one ellipse obviously is a circle. And now these are, you know, I've made these too small, so I'm going to decrease that spacing, and now I've got more of like a little group. And maybe the, the border color that I picked isn't so great here. So maybe uh, something maybe a little brighter like that. And we'll just ramp that opacity right up. So now I've got a significantly larger group uh, that I can work with. But I can still see how would this look at various different sizes. Um, you know, we can even do something interesting. Like we could say, this is going to be for a portrait monitor. So I'm going to punch in 1080 by 1920 instead as the size. And now I can look at what this is going to look like at different sizes. And oh, that's kind of an interesting effect at three, right? So you kind of get the sense of what we're doing here. Fully customizable. It takes seconds to build something that would take days in a media server to be able to put this together. So really, really excited about the direction we're taking with this. I love that so much. I mean, there's, probably, there's about 10 questions I've got because I'm very excited about just using that straight away. This ultimately is really a tease for a second hour that we can probably just do on tiles. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll definitely have you back um, to talk about that. Um, just a very quick question um, was just around Zoom cuts. Does that continue to kind of um, continue along or is that, does that get phased out at some point? We know it was like a, a beta test thing. Sure, sure. So the, the strategy with, with Zoom Cuts was to give everybody an opportunity to play with Apple Shortcuts in our ecosystem and give us feedback about what they thought about that experience. And so we introduced that at WWDC last year, and we've received 
incredible feedback from this community, from other communities as well, who have told us these are the shortcuts we really like. These are the ones that are missing that we would love to add. And the intention has always been to then bring those shortcuts into the Zoom client itself, so you don't have to run a separate app. So the running, by building a separate app, we can iterate very quickly on the features and we can experiment and work with the community. Then we can figure out really what are the things that they, they care about from that experience and move them over. So you've already seen actually the adoption of Apple shortcuts by the mobile app. So Zoom itself, you don't have to run a separate app anymore. You're just running uh, the Zoom app and there are several shortcuts that are available there. I think you're going to see us continue down that pattern um, and I think there's a lot of interesting things to come with that. Uh, but it's really been, uh, I'll just take the opportunity to say if you have any feedback, you've been thinking about it, you haven't shared it yet, jump in the Discord, let us know, uh, and we'll love to you know, take that feedback as we look at taking our next step um, you know, for what we're going to do with Apple Shortcuts in our ecosystem. Andy, thank you so much for your time. Um, as I said, I've said multiple times we can spend hours talking to you and we want to do that, and so we'll look forward to doing that more. But thanks for giving us a little overview. Um, it's been awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you, and it's great to see all of you again and have a wonderful NAB. Thank you. All right, we're going to go um, out to the booths now. We've got Bill down at Atlas. Hello, Bill. Hey, how is everybody doing? It is so cool to be here for another day of NAB. You know, again, I was walking through something and I saw, is that a dog? No, it's not a dog. And you'll understand what I'm talking about in just a minute because I'm sitting here with Atlas, uh, Aldous of the Atlas Lens Company. They're the sparkly booth we've been seeing in the background. They got some cool stuff going on and we're gonna let you talk now. What's up, everyone? It's me, Aldous, from Atlas Lens Co. Um, but you also might know me as my moniker, Dan Keynes. I'm the creator and founder of Atlas Lens Co. And we also have Clint Hannaway with the world's widest anamorphic lens, as well as one of our new focal lengths, the 135. We don't have the 18 at the moment, but we have a 21 silver edition because someone wants to demo it over there. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, we have a q and A. If you tip $5, maybe the dog will do a trick. Venmo's <laughs> at APuyat, at A-P-U-Y-A-T. <laughs> That's awesome. Two or you, is it? You've, is this UK a, based? What is this? No, we're oh, the, sorry. Oh, Mr. Worldwide. What's up, Pitbull? Oh, oh wow. World. The world. Oh, it's not the United States it's web. It's the worldwide. Wow, we are doing it all. All right. Look How's at everyone this. doing we, today? We, we've got quite. We've got quite the energetic vendor. Uh, it, it's great to have you with us. Um, I'm Grant from South Australia. Um, and Hello, we've Grant. Got people. Grants we've or got Grant? People from around the world. Grant, Grant, that's right. Nice to meet you, Grant. Nice Hard to meet T you. for so, side of the D. <clears throat> can you tell us? Can you tell us a little bit um, about the uh, about the range of products that you've that you've got there in the booth? Boy, could I! Oh, here's my intern, Aldis. Hey, what's this robot? Oh, well, I don't know. Let's see. Here, let me let me tell him to sit down. Can you sit, Spot? Hey, Spot, sit down. Sit. Bad dog. Bad. Oh no. I'm oh, Oh no, do we hit him or no? No, 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 we don't. Violence is never the answer. Never, that was a puzzle. No, no, that was a test. I, I saw the creator. You saw the creator. Things things That's true. Things when, you hit, when you hit robots, sometimes they hit back. Yeah. You hear that orange software? And, <laughs> but yeah, sorry, right. was there a question you had, Grant? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, go, let's go to Courtney oh, in Hollywood, who's got a question spot. for us. Oh, we yeah, got a just, question. Okay. This is Spot, by the way, question. guys. Say hi to Spot. SPOT is standing for Superior right, Programmable spot. Optical Technology. Yeah. SPOT is the Atlas Lens Co. mascot. Uh, he's a really good boy most of the time, and uh, we've only been having a few issues with his programming here at the show. Thankfully, no fatalities. Knock on wood. Yeah. Right, Grant? All right, Very what's good. up? Off, off to Courtney. What have you got there? <laughs> oh, my. That, it's, uh... Hey. Oh, that's the guy from Star Trek. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? It's this, the Star Trek guy. Oh, what was his name? John, Jonathan Frakes. Oh, John no, no. oh, I, I, I bear a strange resemblance to okay. John. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, you guys would have right. loved the question if you I heard what there was. Star Trek. <laughs> Definitely John the reference. All right. The question. The question was: uh, Is that uh, 21 millimeter? Uh, is that the Orion series? And is it a T2 or do you have? Uh, yeah. What, what range of uh, T-stops do you have on these uh, new animals? We have the T2, and then it goes to T2.6, I believe, for the 135. Let's see, T2.2 for the 135 and the 200 as well. 
Yeah, so the Orion series is generally T2 across the line. Uh, the newer lenses, uh, the 135 and the 200, as well as I believe the 18 and the 21 are T2.2. And then with the- 1821 is T2. Oh, 1821 is T2. Um, and then it's different for the, um, for the Mercury series, which are full frame lenses. Used on the creator. What? What's up, Oren Software? He's eating the Habit Burger in the back right now, but he would have loved to join. Very nice guy. Okay. Give him a handshake. Sometimes it's wet, <laughs> sometimes it's not, and it's usually me who has the wet hand. I get nervous. You hear me, Oren Software? I get nervous. ASC on the way. All right, next question. <laughs> so, <clears throat> do you want to show us around the booth a little bit? Um, we'll, oh boy, do I. Sense, yeah. Oh, hey, Clint, we should bring Spot. Oh, thank you. Thank you, William. All right. Over spot. We got a tour. You guys ready for this tour? We got the cinema anamorphic motion booth right now. We have E-Man. This is E-Man. E-Man, say hi to the World Wide Web. Oh, everyone is seeing me right now? I have hey. no idea how people hey, are. guys. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Okay. I've got it. Hi, E-Man. All right, guys. Busy guy. Busy guy. That's what we do at Atlas. We work hard. All right. So we also have this anamorphic motion booth. We do a music video. We do a quick music video. Do a dance. And then if you do a dance, upload it to your Instagram, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to us, you get a free shot glass and perhaps alcohol in the back if you are 21. Yeah, frame, frame is great. Have you? Oh, frame.io. Frame. Didn't we just come out with a version four? The one with the metadata. Yeah, yeah, I hear good things about the metadata. But all right, let's go interview people on a lunch break. I don't know if this is illegal. Sorry, HR. Hey, guys, we're here on the World Wide Web. Uh, Miette, do you have anything to say? The director of Filmed on Atlas. Um, uh, Hi. Register to vote. <laughs> you hear that, World Wide Web? Do that. <laughs> if not, get a fake. We'll let you vote. Oh, DM me. I'll let you vote for me. All right, guys, so we have um, we have Riona, we have Josh, we have B, we have Miet, my colleagues, um, as I give this tour. I should probably go around because it's very tight back there. All right, we'll back up. We'll back up. Thank you, William. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, also, let me show you the shot glass we have right now. Do I drink at work sometimes? I don't know. It, that seems yeah, obvious. Come by, get yourself yeah. some free Atlas Lensco glass. That's... That's what we're delivering today. If you come by our booth, make yourself a video selfie, upload it to the cloud, we will give you free Atlas glass. Shot glass, but still glass. Yes, sir. All right, guys, let's move it along. We also have, well, we have free flights. We have ready rigs. Ooh, what? The gang, it's Alessandro. Wait, no, it's Tom Cruise. What? Yeah, no, it's Alessandro. How's it going? Tom Cruise here. I'm also uh, the father of Spot. I'm, uh, okay. How's it going? You made Spot? It was a very complicated relationship. Sorry, uh, All right, we won't. What, what, what's this rated? All right, yeah, let's keep it going. William's telling me to move. All right, guys, we also have Module 8 tuners here. Module 8 tuners, and we also have the free fly systems. What's up, guys? How you doing? We make a variable lens tuner, so you can take any lens, and you can give it the character of Super Baltars, K35s, anamorphic lenses. Forget detuning, forget dropping hundreds of thousands of dollars on vintage K35s. You use a sharp set of Zeiss lenses, you can use DZO lenses, you can use anything from expensive to low cost. You put our detuners on, we give you three different vibes. It's infinitely variable. So instead of, instead of having someone decide your look for you, decide your own look, we call it uh, your look. It's, it's variable, variable tuning. It stays in focus as a function of, of the adjustment and it breathes life into any set of lens and let you, it lets you jump on the vintage lens bandwagon for a very economical cost, so that's them. Moment.com and B&H are selling them right now in the US, and uh, they're, they're gonna great. be a kind of a revolutionary, you're gonna see that you're gonna see variable tuning lenses, whether there are adapters or whether they're built into, into final primes, will be the hottest thing to happen in lenses over the next three years. Everybody's gonna do variable lenses, so. You hear that, guys? One of the first, and they're with us. Booth C5539 up until tomorrow, World Wide Web. All right, time to get back into the cameras. We have Julian Jerry, director and editor and filmmaker and talented man and guy with a beard who's also made Rocket Man for the Atlas Lens Coach channel. I don't know how many people are viewing this, but they gave me a mic. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> what are you guys doing? What's happening? Welcome to Atlas. I want to give us a tour of what lens we have right here, Julian. So this is a 
Alexa Mini LF shooting full frame open gate. And this is the Mercury Lens Series 42 millimeter T2.2. And as you can see, it's looking fire. Love these there lenses, go. golden flares, <laughs> super small, travel friendly, beautiful 1.5X squeeze, super dope lenses. Very I cool. have an FX6. You guys are shooting on an FX6 right now. I use these on the FX6. It's like a perfect combo. Mercury series That's shipping amazing. now. Hit up Jul add Julian A. Jerry, right? There's an A in the middle. Yes. Your Instagram, Julian A. Jerry on Instagram. Uh, Filmmaker, what right. a guy. Aldous, I met Aldous, him gonna, four hours ago in real life. We're going yep, okay. to wrap it up right now. Thank you. You want you, me to keep Aldous going? There's a Papa John's we no, can no, go no. to. Okay. I'm sure there's lots, but right. we're going we're gonna to stop now. Uh, Thank, you. Angry. Thank you so okay, much. Guys. We're going to pull it now. Thanks for your time. It was fun. Come see me live. Uh, okay, oh. bye, guys. Thank you okay. so much. I'm Dan Goodbye. James. Thank you. All right. That was a roller coaster of, of a booth. We're now going to go uh, off to um, uh, Purge Systems. Um, and I think we've got Jeffrey Powers um, coming in on our live view. Let's cut to that now. All right, here we are at PJ Systems. Uh, Jeffrey Powers here. We got Matt from PJ Systems. Uh, have to help you having a great show here. Yeah, it's been great. So we're gonna we're gonna go through the line. Why don't you get uh, started as to what we're gonna be talking about? So let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, sure. So PJ Systems, we're a workstation manufacturer, focus in post production, content creation, all that kind of jazz. And our bread and butter has always been tower workstations. We've done that for a very long time. We've been around for twenty four years, I believe now. It's really been our bread and butter. Uh, these days, though, we're starting to expand out, we're really realizing that it's beyond just tower workstations. Uh, mobile workstations is something we are getting into again. Uh, we used to sell them, getting into it again. High power, not thin and light, but high performance uh, for the people who are wanting to do virtual production on the go, Gen AI on the go, uh, work with raw footage on set, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's a very big new thing for us. Uh, we also are starting to do more and more rack mount, whether it's a rack mount workstation for something like virtual production, like a render node, or just storage, you know, big, beefy, more traditional kind of server kind of things. Okay, well, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> a lot of great stuff here. Yeah. Uh, we kind of went through that really quick. Yeah, that's just so a quick rundown. Let, let's, let's go back over to the yeah. desktop here. And uh, uh, so y you've been doing desktops for a while. These are yeah. completely con uh, configurable. Uh, are you using Intel? Are you using AMD? What kind of processing are you at? Yeah, we really go with whatever is the right thing. And that changes from generation to generation. It changes according to what Adobe is doing or what Blackmagic is doing. Uh, so these days, uh, it's kind of even, evenly split. The more consumer-focused kind of systems, they tend to be more predominantly Intel. The higher-end workstations for, like, say, DaVinci Resolve tend to be more AMD's Threadripper or Threadripper Pros. Uh, so really, for us, it's not what's the brand, not what's the model. It's what's the right thing with the current technology, with the current workflows, and using that. Because it's constantly changing, constantly. It's always different. Yeah, so you're, you're talking to people and you're getting conversations going and you're yes. understanding what they need and then you build a system from that. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the number one thing I always encourage people to do, if they're in the market for a workstation and they're looking at us or anyone else, it's always get on the phone, start talking to people. Because, uh, I mean, our consultants, they're terrific because they... They've received a lot of training from uh, like my, my team to the lab team where we keep up on every, all the trends and everything. And we give a lot of training about what is raw, what is a codec, what's, um, how are people integrating between After Effects and Premiere Pro, like what's dynamic link, and so that they can have a conversation in your language. Okay. You don't have to talk gigahertz and megabytes and all that kind of stuff. It's no, I'm using Premiere Pro. I work with uh, ProRes 422 footage. What is it that I need? Because okay. right, that's that's the most important thing. And yeah. so we, we're the translator. You don't have to try to learn our language. We can learn yours. Okay. So yeah. it sounds like you're a soup, soup to nuts type of uh, shop here to answer any questions, give them the support that they need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, sometimes the answer that we give is not, this is the workstation you need. Sometimes it's, oh, hey, you know, a workstation would help but you might want to tweak your workflow. Um, and like, we're not going to give them that training, but we can point them in the right direction. You know, oftentimes that comes up with, uh, especially in like the, um, 
like freelancer kind of work. They might be working with H six sixty four footage, and our recommendation to them might not be, "Hey, get a big beefy workstation." It's, "Hey, does your camera support HEVC and like a format that we have hardware decoding support for?" Okay, because that could give them a much bigger boost to performance than just throwing money at hardware. Absolutely. So, yeah. all right, now let's go to the back over to the laptop here, because yeah. this is really interesting. We, we he kind of glossed over this, but <laughs> it, he, he said, "Yeah, we could definitely do a lot of AI, and we're seeing AI." But what you're seeing, I'm going to have them point to this, the big screen right there, and what's happening is the webcam is pointing at our camera crew right now, and generative AI is making some really cool visuals out of that. So tell us about that. Yeah, it doesn't quite know what to do with all the cameras, I think. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so this is using stable diffusion as the base, and it is doing an image to image. So we have a text prompt that's telling it, you know, hey, make these kind of robot things or make these like really crazy cosmic characters. Um, and yeah, it's generating at about an image every second, second and a half or so. Okay. And that's all just done on a laptop. Yeah. Um, and so the software we're using is actually from a company called Devon Studio. Uh, and they're gearing this more towards like events. Like honestly, this kind of exact thing we're doing right here. It's a oh, draw yeah. and it's really interesting and cool. I could see my, you know how they have the picture booths? Mm -hmm. I could see it where they have the camera set up and you, instead of you getting a picture, you get yeah. an AI art. Yep, and it. it doesn't have to be this like really abstracty kind of stuff. It could be uh, you're doing some event in Texas and you want people to be like cowboys. Okay. Uh, and that kind of stuff. So, so it, it could be, hats yeah, there. it could be really tailored to what you are, what your event is about. Uh, but you no, know, the reason we're using it is because we're showing how we can do this on a laptop. Okay. So if you are doing like events, you can take it with you. You don't have to bring a whole desktop, a big like rack mount or anything. You can do it you know, on the fly. Absolutely. Um, and you know that's just a very specific use case. I mean, these systems are also terrific for you know video editors who want to be able to work with like raw footage on set. Yeah. You know, they're doing like some dailies. Uh, maybe they don't have the time to generate proxies. So, hey, you can like get it done on this kind of a workstation. Now, uh, what's in this workstation? Sure, so the, the technical specs, the, yeah. the stuff I love. Let's get it, let's uh, dig yeah. into it, yes. Uh, so the CPU is an Intel Core i9-14900HX. Okay. Uh, it's very similar to the desktop 14900K, just power limited, because it's a laptop, you got limited power. Uh, the GPU is a NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4090. So it's the okay. top-end GPU. Um, it doesn't perform the same as a desktop 4090. Again, power is the primary thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's about the same as a mid-range uh, GeForce GPU, which is still terrific yeah. uh, for even you know this kind of thing. So Absolutely. the fact that you can get that amount of performance in something that's mobile is uh, frankly amazing, especially with all these new workflows about Gen AI, virtual production, um, you know, there's tons of booths even here at NAB that are running LED walls. You can run it off of something like this. You don't have to ship a whole desktop and a keyboard and monitor and mouse and all that stuff. It's just exactly. right there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, doing video switching, it, it's great to actually have a beefy system that mm -hmm. I can do a lot of different things, especially when you start bringing a lot of cameras in there. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, how heavy is that? It's heavy. Okay. <laughs> uh, I believe uh, the base unit itself is about seven pounds, uh, and then there's a big beefy power brick that I think is about four pounds. So we are not marketing it as an ultralight. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it is. It is a mobile workstation. You and definitely want with the good battery and everything. You definitely want that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and really, these kind of units they draw so much power that you don't want to work off of battery unless you're forced to. Exactly. Uh, you get a decent penalty to performance working off battery. So then again, uh, if somebody accidentally pulls the cord out. You don't lose you, anything. You don't lose anything. You just plug it back in, get started, get back to where you were. Exactly. And continue. Exactly. Yeah, but it's really, it's bread and butter is going to be when you can have it plugged in and it's going to operate off of that. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, it's also great, you know, people doing things out of like, uh, you know, trucks and things like that. Um, you know, you need something on the go. It's some extra thing that's in addition to, you know, whatever rack mount, you know, server things you have in your broadcast truck. You can have something like this that you can plug into your generator and it can do quite a bit. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's uh, let's move back over to the rack here really quick. Yeah, sure. Uh, tell us some, some more about what we've got in here. Yeah, so rack mounted things have changed quite a bit since uh, COVID times, I would say, actually. Okay. Um, like at the bottom there, that's a storage, you know, traditional rack mount storage. We also do traditional, you know, big, beefy, multi-CPU kind of, you know, th that kind of stuff. Um, but these kind of ones up here that are up you know, a little bit higher, those are more what we call rack mount workstations. Okay. And it's actually the exact same hardware we put into our desktops, but in a rack. And there's multiple reasons for that. Things like render nodes for virtual production. Yeah. 
you actually don't really want kind of the servery hardware. You really want workstation hardware because it's okay. running Unreal Engine. That's true. It's really made for that kind of stuff. So it's really the same hardware. Toss it in there. Cool. Now you can put it in a rack. You get density. You can put it off in a server closet or whatever. So um, yeah, you don't do an exchange server off of this. You do. Uh, no. You do all this production off of that. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, the other area that we've seen a lot of increase in recently is virtual desktop. Yeah. So you have staff that work from home and at the office, or they work always at home, but you want to be able to control the data. The, your yeah. data, your media files never go off site. Especially if you have you know, set up an ESXi with uh, 2,800 users, you want yeah. to be able to uh, have them, give them the ability to do the remote work, whether it be coloring, whether it be uh, mm -hmm. audio, whether it be whatever. So. Yeah, and, and this kind of a setup, again, since it's the same as the desktop hardware, that's kind of when you, you have users that need a performance above a level of a virtualized environment. So you're not chopping up a CPU, you're not chopping up a GPU, they get the entire system. Um, so if you have someone doing high-end color work or they're doing a lot of like rendering or again like messing around with AI stuff because you're, you're like trying to figure out that workflow but you still want to keep everything on your internal network. Yeah. That's where you go to these rack mount workstations. So you're not doing any virtualization. It's a standard workstation. You're just using something like Parsec or HP Anywhere yeah. that will allow them to access it remotely from anywhere. Yeah, that's awesome. So are, are we... Is, are we are you focused on Intel or AMD or you mix? It's, it is a mix. On these kind of systems, because they're looking for higher performance, typically we're using AMD Threadripper or Threadripper Pro. Okay. Uh, just depends on whether they need more memory, more memory channel, or more uh, yeah, memory channels or PCIe ch lanes. Um, so most of these systems are going to be using Threadripper or Threadripper Pro okay. for the CPU. GPU? Almost everything is going to be NVIDIA. Um, okay. That's just kind of the, the standard right now. AMD is doing great stuff, yeah. but not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, what about other vendors like memory or or, uh, or storage drives? Yeah, so those often aren't talked about as much. So I'm glad you're bringing yeah. that up. Uh, well, it's, it's it's very important to some people. They got you. I want uh, I want this type of brand versus this type of brand. Yeah, and uh, that that's a big decision in in their picking their systems. Yeah, so for what we do is we are not tied to any one brand. Okay. And we change actually fairly often. Um, so we use a lot of Zeus parts. We use a lot of uh, Gigabyte, uh, MSI, Samsung, uh, Seagate, Western Digital. We change depending on what is the best thing at the moment. Okay. Because uh, a lot of these companies, they go through waves. And um, sometimes they'll have really high quality parts that are really well designed. They've got a great like a BIOS team or a firmware team that we can get fixes with. And then sometimes like someone leaves the company or there's shifts. And so then we're going up and down with these companies. So that's kind of our role is to make it so that the end user doesn't have to care about whether this is a Zeus or a Gigabyte. We've done all that qualification process okay. to a much bigger degree than anyone else could do. Okay. Cool. Do we have any uh, questions? No questions yet. So okay. Uh, well, we we saw the main desktops. What's uh, uh, any any popular systems that you guys have been working out? Yeah, I mean, all of our stuff changes depending on what people are doing. But um, there's really a couple of standards I would say for in this space. Uh, we often do like an Intel Core i9 14900K system with like a RTX 4080 or 4090. It's kind of our standard. I would call it all-arounder kind of a system. It's got a lot of great stuff. Intel QuickSync lets you do hardware decoding. Um, and then when you go a step up, it's a big price jump. Yeah. But to go up to something like Threadripper, uh, typically a 32 or 60 core core Threadripper is very popular, again, with NVIDIA GPUs. But that's where you get into, like, I want to do two GPUs, or I'm using DaVinci Resolve doing a bunch of noise reduction. I want three. Yeah. Uh, so really, you kind of jump between Intel Core, AMD Threadripper. Okay. So... I wouldn't call and ask for. I want one desktop. The, you're you're more into doing uh, multiple machines for customers that you know big offices and. and um, it's actually both. Oh, um, it? okay. We still probably the majority of the total like invoice orders are for um, people buying just a single system, maybe two. Uh, but then we do have a number of customers who, yeah, they want ten, they want twenty. Uh, sometimes they want like a hundred. Yeah. Um, Sometimes those are spread out, you know, why we want 20 a month for a year. Sometimes it's just, hey, we want 100 right now. But we are really set up for both. Okay. Um, our production department, they've got sections that's for 1Z, 2Z orders, and they've got big, you know, production, or like, you know, 
product line, you know, they're going through and they're building a whole bunch of systems all at once. Okay. And there's some things we can do differently depending on those. Like the single orders, we order they you know, order the system, we install Windows, we do all of tests and we ship it out. For those larger orders, oftentimes we actually allow their IT departments to remote in, do whatever setup they want to do so that oh, okay. we don't have to ship it to their IT department. They do something, they box it up, they ship it out to their end users. They can bypass all that. And just yeah, go straight you don't from have our that back straight. and forth rigmarole. Yeah. Because yeah. the less time you can spend on a truck with FedEx or UPS, the better. Exactly. Because yeah. you got to get going. You got to. Yeah. Gotta, well, gotta and it's run. just more potential time for things to break. Yeah, absolutely. Because these are you know big systems. They're heavy, and the more time it's on a truck, the more times it's going to be rolled over end to end. Yeah, so, you absolutely. Know. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like those flattened desktops. They just no, don't work. no, and we no. do what we can to prevent that damage, exactly. but there's only so much you can do. So uh, we'll go back here for uh, for a minute here. So uh, let's let's do a soup to nuts uh, setup. Uh, what type of time frame does it take to get these sure. going? Uh, for just like an order of one or two systems, I believe our ship time right now is about two weeks because um, everything is you know custom built. Uh, sometimes it can be longer if there's part delays, but we're very transparent about that. You're never going to order a system and then find out, oh, it's going to be two months. It's no, no, we're up front. If there's any shortages, you know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's traditionally about that. Or obviously, larger quantity orders can take longer just because it's you know, okay. more stuff to do. Yeah, and desktops and laptops are fairly straightforward. Yeah, yeah. To... well, laptops, we can go quite a bit faster uh, just because there's less customization on these units. The CPU, the GPU are all soldered down. So when we get the units, we're installing memory, we're installing storage, and then the rest of it is about testing, making sure nothing is broken before it goes out the door. Okay. We want it to break for us, not for the end user. Oh, wow. Okay. That's cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's talk about mixed environments, mm -hmm. Mac environments versus PC. Uh, how, how do you fit that into uh, PJ systems? Yeah. So, I mean, that's very common, especially these days, I would say, where there might be shops that were always using Mac just because it was the easiest, it was straightforward. Um, but now they're wanting to do virtual production. And Unreal doesn't really play well Not with Apple. No. <laughs> yeah. Or they're wanting to do like DaVinci Resolve and they want to be able to take advantage of multiple GPUs and so they want to get more performance. Or this Gen AI stuff, it's yeah. really being developed on the PC side first uh, and Apple kind of second. So we are getting even more of those kind of people who are really mixing things together. and. It works. It does work. Um, there is some about, you know, just like the hotkeys are different. You got to get kind of used to that. But there are ways to work around that. Uh, but yeah, we do that quite often. Okay. Got a question in here yeah. from uh, Mickey Matkacher from the Philippines. I'm a big fan of your research and testing papers on highly specific workflows. Can you talk to us about this process? Oh, sure. I could absolutely. That's actually uh, my team that does all that, that well, te performance testing. So there you I go, can Mickey. talk about it for, for, you got about three hours, right? Uh, sure. Okay. No, but yeah, really our goal on that kind of testing is to look at what are people doing in the real world and then bringing that into like Premiere Pro or After Effects and then testing it in a way that we can do it over and over and over and over. Because if you're only looking at performance on like one CPU, you can kind of guess how like different CPUs will work, but it never really lines up in reality. Okay. So we try to take, it kind of feels like a shotgun approach somewhat. You know, let's test every CPU that AMD is releasing and every CPU that Intel and see how they perform because you can't use one as an example for the other. And so that, that's the approach we take is we make our benchmark so we can run it re you know, repeatedly and, so, and then just test as much as we can. Okay. So it's the only way to get you know, real numbers. All right. Next up, we have uh, Eric Strand from Essex uh, Connect is asking, do you see any use case for NUC units. Yeah, we actually are current, I think we're currently selling or we previously were very recently. Uh, and yeah, quite a bit actually. Uh, a lot of people, especially if you have a mixed um, user base where there's power users to do big beefy systems and the people who don't need quite as much, maybe they're on like the photography team, uh, graphic design, but they still want to buy from one company. We were selling quite a few of those NUCs. Um, it's a little bit odd right now because Intel stopped making the NUX and Zeus is picking them yeah, up. Is, yeah. So we're kind of in a transition phase right now and we're kind of seeing if the laptop will be able to fill that gap without us having to have another point point in our product line. But yeah, there's there's a lot of use for those because you can get a lot of power out of those small little NUX. Okay. And, and you said Asus, you're not doing the, the uh, side party uh, NUX or their, their knockoff NUX? Um, 
well, because Asus is going to be the official manufacturer for NUX. Yeah. Um, Non-branded PC. No, if we sold them, we would sell them as Asus NUX. Okay. Uh, okay. We wouldn't probably do a rebrand because uh, we are always very transparent about okay. what it is we're selling. That's cool. And in that case, what the benefit we're giving what? is mm -hmm. we can help you make sure that the configuration is right still, and there's the support side. You know, if you have an issue, you can tell us, I'm having this issue in Premiere. We know what Premiere is. We know what dynamic link is and we can help you figure out is this hardware is this software is there an adobe bug you know okay. what is it actually last question uh is back at mickey mcature from philippines can you talk really quick about the extensive stress testing and q a process yeah for all of our systems yeah because we do test stress test all of the systems before they go out the door um and we do low level things we're like testing memory and like hard drive very specifically uh but then we also do like a lot of the benchmarks we develop, we actually run on every single system. So if you're buying a system for Premiere Pro, we're actually benchmarking Premiere Pro and After Effects and Photoshop. We're really running it through the workflows that you're going to be using it. Because we could run a bunch of game benchmarks and that kind of stuff, what you might see with like you know, a lot of the hardware reviews, but it's not using hardware in the same way. We would rather be testing it so that if there is a Premiere Pro bug with the latest GPU drivers, we want to know that. Yeah, so it's a yeah. big deal for us. We could talk. We could talk more. We did have a couple more questions, but we have to move on. Matt, thank you very much. PJ Systems, back to you guys. Awesome, man. Seeing some of those uh, big workstations and talking about that, and I love Mickey's questions as well. Talking about all the how they do their reports, it's really cool. Check out their website. Um, now moving to rigging camera uh, mounting on some awesome cranes. Jason, what have you got there? at Techno crane. Boy, you're not kidding, Grant. These are some awesome cranes. I am here with Horst, and he is gonna he's gonna talk to the panel and answer your questions. Yeah, my name is Horst Bobolam, and I'm from Technocrane, from the Czech Republic. And if possible, I will try to answer all your questions. Yeah, great. Um, can you tell us about the range um, of, of products? Kind of, is there the little small cranes and then moving up to basically big ones? We, yeah, me. basically we have four products or four, three product lines. Uh, the lightweight, it's called Techno Crane, so that's all for television market. Then you have the heavier stuff, it's called Super Techno Cranes. They are payload of like an IMAX camera, so 35 kilos, something like this. And then the last one, we have a fully automatic versions. They're called the Techno Dolly, also in three different sizes. And there you have then pre-programmed um, uh, cranes. And they are for special effects in movies and for uh, something like uh, permanently installation in TV studios, where you have always every hour an opening or closing um, so this, let's say, the precise movements. That's amazing. Can you, is there a bit of a demo that's happening right now behind us? Is that yes? Is that, yes, is the that, crane is moving the in the back, and these yeah. are all telescopic cranes. So, and like I said, they move precisely exactly the path which you want to have. Wow. And what sort of control system is it used, and sort of the programming of that? Can you show us a little bit um, of that that system? Um, uh, it would be a little bit difficult to show you, okay. but in general, okay. it's, um, you work like a normal crew. So you have a cameraman, you have a director, you have a grip, and you swing the crane, the cameraman sits behind the monitor, he says, uh, or he moves then the camera, head left to right, up and down, so that he has a good... And um, that's the traditional way of working because, yes, with, with actors or with a presenter or whatsoever. But if you want to have pre-programmed moves, then you simply uh, make keyframes and the crane travels via all these keyframes. And then you, for example, for this presentation, which we have here, we have 70 keyframes during five minutes. So you have a very, let's say, uh, fast move through all the ski frames. Yeah, and, and a big advantage of that, I guess, is the repeatability of the exact same shot. You could keep doing that, that exact movement over and over to take different takes, is that right? Yes, uh, yeah, that's, that's um, uh, like CNN or they want to have something like a cooperative identity all the time so that every hour it's exactly the same movement, it's exactly the closing and in between naturally you have the two guys talking to each other or three guys and you have always the same setting and 
like I said, again, in special effects and movies, it's everything different. Yes, yeah. Um, down in Hollywood, uh, we've got Courtney who wants to ask a question here. So the, the big crane that's uh, going back and forth and back of you right now, that's operated by, that would be operated by the dolly grip, uh, and it, it doesn't have motorized pan tilt, just counterbalance uh, pan tilt. Is that manually operated? And for the Mo MoCo type cranes, uh, they're then hands-free. Do they, do they operate with servo control tilt and pan? I didn't understand you correctly, but um, basically all cranes are the, look the same and you just switch the motors on or off. For example, during programming, you, you are still have the grip, you have to still the cameraman, and once you finish the program, you take your hands off and then the motors um, um, execute the path which the, where the camera is moving along. Got it. So uh, there are motors on there, even though the... Uh a dolly grip is is pushing it up and down manually uh, during the programming phase, or during, uh, or they can just turn the motors off and operate it manually if you don't need repeatability. Basically, for 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 pro programming or for designing the shot, you are still manual, and then once you finish the de design, then you do it uh, uh, mechanically. Okay. Gotcha. And, and so what, is, what has been some, I know that Technocrane have, uh, have been around for a long time. Um, how, what, what's sort of been the, the um, advancements of things that have happened in, in more recent days? What, what, what are the things that have been changing? Uh, we get bigger, so... See if that comes Over up. there. Oh, yeah. uh, and then you have uh, also smaller cranes, which are very light. Yes, so for, for a YouTuber, for example, he wants something, what he can put in, in his garage, and what is also very, let's say, economically. So we start with 70, 80,000 euros. You get already a complete set, which you can work with. So we get smaller and we get bigger, and actually, we have still have the traditional uh, cranes for the traditional use. And, and what are you seeing in the industry as far as the, the trends going? You, I guess uh, to your point there, it does sound like it's both extremes. It's, it, it's the garage YouTube operator and it's yes. also the, the big movie makers as well. Is that right? Yes, correct, correct. And yeah, mm. it's basically... Um, Due to YouTube, everything changed a little bit. In this, is it you, the cameras get smaller, so the cranes get get smaller. Uh, everything is more accessible. It's not a, you don't need a five man crew anymore. You can be on your own. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And and uh, just generally, you you've uh, I imagine you've been to the NAB show many times. Um, what yes. are you seeing? Uh, what are you seeing different? Now, um, this year, are you seeing anything different or any sort of trends that you're seeing across the show as you walk around? Yes, we, we see, um, let's say, the TV stations, they change a little bit. So it's not the faces anymore. It's, they have a little bit more storytelling in it. They have a little bit more virtual stories to, to, to tell. Because I think it's, it's um, as a TV station, you have to be different than just a YouTuber. And so you have to invest in this visual storytelling. And I think there we, we come into play. So, so some of the television shows, they are nearly as complicated as real special effects movies. Mm. So that's a little bit my impression. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we've got a, a text question that came in um, from our audience. Courtney? Yeah, we got a question in from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, and he asked, uh, do crane operators need any kind of certification and how is training handled? No, no, no. It's, it's, uh, naturally, it's good if you have some training, but that's very basic. It's, it's like with a photographer, yes? You can hold the camera, but th this does not ensure that the, the picture which you will take is good. So it's more a question of talent, of taste, and not so much a uh, question of, of uh, a certification. Naturally, you have to know what you're doing because the crane, there's a counterweight, and so you can hurt someone, um, but that's quite basic. 
Next question. Well, that kind of leads into our next question because they're asking about safety. James Fosselin from Minneapolis, Minnesota says, "Is there any? Are there any safety protocols? As that is a uh, running a pre-programmed route, and it's a big heavy yard." Yes, um, you have always a, a dead man switch because we are working in between of children, we are working in between of audience, and uh, you you never know what happens. So it's always one a person who who push a, a button and uh, who ensures that the crane is running while he's pushing the button. Once he puts the button uh, the dump off, everything stops. That's great. It's like a dead man switch. That's great. Yes. That's very, very, yeah. very cool. And naturally, if you have no people around, then you can work without. But if you have people yeah. around, then you uh, have this uh, dead man switch. That's great. Horst, thank you so, so you much see, for in the your back, time. You see, you see yeah, yes. the presenter. Yes. Oh, yes, it's following around. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your time. It was a pleasure Enjoy to talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Have All right, so we move we move from around uh, the the hall there, and we go back to our booth um, where we've got Trevor Morgan um, from Open Drives. Hey, Trevor. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me here. Doing doing really well. Hey, tell us all about um, Open Drives and and kind of what piece of the market and the problems that you're solving. Yeah, so Open Drives is in the um, data storage market, and we are a company that um, formed in the 2010-2011 period. Um, uh, basically, uh, the founders of our company were um, technical creatives who were supporting directors like David Fincher as they were creating very experimental, very uh, experimenting with high resolution content uh, and supporting these theatrical workflows. And what they found, our founders who were supporting David Fincher, what they found was that the storage vendors who were providing storage capabilities for um, very ambitious projects like these uh, couldn't really keep up with the workflows, whether we're talking about latency or throughput. Um, they just couldn't get to where they needed to be. So our founders basically created their own storage, created a NAS, NAS storage device that then solved these problems and drastically reduced latency um, drastically increased throughput, and then growing organically from there, started supporting other of their friends and contacts in the m and &E workspace. So we became a, a very successful boutique provider of NAS technology for m and &E. What's happened over the last few years is that we've recognized that the strength of our platform was less in designing and participating on the hardware side of the equation, more on the software platform that was powering our NAS. And so we've been on a very interesting journey to convert from that sort of mix of hardware software to being a software only provider of storage. So I don't want to say full blown software defined, but we are now 100% a software company. We work closely with our third-party vendors uh, for, for hardware, and we obviously participate in the types of specs that are required by our m and &E customers, um, but we focus on the software that not only continues to create very high performance storage, but also expands um, the capabilities into areas like data tiering, and obviously the push to the cloud and hybrid cloud storage. And so that's where we exist right now. We've made that transition. We are a software-only company with a successful uh, ecosystem of uh, hardware partners. And, um, but we've retained our roots in very high performance, very high value software. It's fascinating. It's exactly exactly what I was just trying to I was trying to work out is hardware or software or you know kind of both and then and then mostly software. So, explain to me like the 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 customer experience is the software running on NAS um, appliances, or is it also is it something that you can run on a on a computer that you you spec out to be a NAS? Yeah, it, it, those are great questions and um, what. One of the jokes I like to say is, is that well, we're a software company only, so we don't care about hardware, do we? Well, obviously we do. All software needs that hardware to run on it. Um, 
And, and the hardware for the types of customers that we support, and if we look at, at the m and &E space that we're in, we're not down to the prosumer level. But as you start stair-stepping up from there, from the, um, the, the, the small to medium size uh, post shops, all the way up to the, the, the very large uh, live broadcast customers, those are our, that's our customer base, so let's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, our customer base going from enterprise to sort of medium to, to lower mid-market. And all of those are going to require hardware that is very capable. Um, and so what we're doing is working with our partners to have, um, you know, the right spec hardware that can drive our software, but we've made an arrangement where while we're consulting with our hardware partners, while we're rigorously running the supported platforms through our certification program, our customers can go directly to the hardware vendors and, and work out those arrangements. Obviously, we're involved in the mix to get them at the right price point, and then they come to us for the software that has been certified on the platform of choice, uh, and then we support them end to end from uh, initial deployment all the way through cutover and then support them as they're running their workflows. Wow, that's really cool. Lots of our, <clears throat> excuse me, lots of our uh, audience, our community um, uh, use Blackmagic gear. Uh, and we, we've, we've been really interested to see how Blackmagic moving into lots into 10 gig um, and then lots of uh, network storage and their their announcement this year around um, Resolve Replay um, and and Hyperdeck recorders that are um, being able to record out directly to NAS and then and then Resolve bringing that in and playing back and multi user and all of that. Now I know that you you have um, some sort of uh, experience and and integration or or um, compatibility with with some of that Black Magic gear. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So when we when we um, when we talk about uh, those players such as Black Magic or Adobe um, w with their software platforms, um, we we obviously support those workflows from what their their users are doing to say do their post editing or whatnot. But we add an extra dimension in working with those types of vendors. I might cite uh, uh, Adobe in the Adobe Premiere space where we worked closely earlier on in our company to find ways not just to support their users and the traditional workflows that they were running, but to find ways to accelerate that. Um, we did that accelerate, you, you might think, um, well, acceleration is easy. You do that at the, ho at the, at the hardware layer. Um, but that's really not true. Part of that, and this is what really led us on this journey to being software only, our software is um, really geared around very intelligent, aggressive caching. So whether we're talking about Premiere, whether we're talking about Blackmagic, we can, uh, I say we, I'm starting to uh, look at it from the software's perspective, our software is sensitive to, let's say, the editing stream, and if, if there's a playback going in a certain direction, our software starts to make assumptions about, okay, we're gonna take a chunk of the, of the uh, content moving that in this forward movement and uh, cache that. And the more the direction of that flow keeps moving, the software makes assumptions of let's grab more and more from the storage uh, media and put that into cache. And that's how we accelerate those workflows uh, for Blackmagic, for the Adobe Premiere uh, users. And so for us, we make that seamless to the user. The user just understands when they're scrubbing back and forth, even with very high resolution content, they will not have any lagginess or latency. It just keeps running very smoothly and it's all automated underneath the, the uh, hood where we're looking at what the user and the, the software suite is doing and doing the appropriate caching uh, and making sure that data is being read straight from cache, not from the storage media. That makes sense. And so from a, from a client point of view, as in a, a, as a, a PC or a Mac, I assume, the, the being able to use um, Mac and PC. Is there any software that's installed on those clients or it's all just what's happening off of the NAS and, and, and it's just waiting for the requests? 
Yeah, it's just waiting for the request. So when when you're really, we, we, we like to say that the users of uh, of an open drive system uh, or, or a, a comparable NAS is really going to be the administrators and the people who are setting up your storage pools, setting up the different uh, options to optimize for the workflow. But when the users are running through their workflows, when they're when they're in their editing suite, um, they just know that they're they're grabbing um, and pointing to or working with content in these stored areas. And so it's a lot of it is seamless. Uh, one of our VPs came from one of the large gaming. Uh, 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 companies out there. And so he was a customer before he came into our organization. And he likes to say that when he was a customer, what he loved about open drives and what his teams loved about open drives is that they didn't know we were there, that things just worked and accelerated and they didn't have to stop and say, is there something wrong with the open drive storage? And so we do strive in this space to be very seamless and transparent in the workflow, just supporting and rendering up the content in an accelerated fashion, reducing that latency so that the user isn't having to think about us. We want our users to be thinking about their workflows, about their creative output, and leaving the rest to the administrators when they deploy or support uh, uh, those creatives. So creatives, if they're thinking about open drives, that's probably not a good thing, and we get the feedback over and over again, we don't have to think about you. We just know that the storage is constantly there feeding us the content in such a way that we don't see any performance hits. We don't impede right. their creative process. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, Courtney, we've got a question that came in from Eric. Okay, uh, I have a question too, but we'll do this. Eric first from Essex, Connecticut. He says, besides the connection speed to the NAS, does a codec play a role in specking out the NAS? Um, it, it does. Obviously, uh, you know we, you know we we support various codecs. We support, um, you know, uh, if we look at it from a, a connectivity protocol perspective, uh, SMB, NFS. All of these are options that we have to take into consideration as we're starting to consult with our prospects. We have uh, systems engineers uh, and solutions architects who work with, um, if it's through a partner, we work with our partners. And, and you're, you're asking a question that is really key to the space. You're not going to get a cookie cutter uh, NAS that's just going to be dropped in and everything's just going to work. If you want it to support the creatives in this way, we have to understand the codex. We have to understand, is this NFS, is this SMB? And there are lots of different parameters that then we can ensure are enacted so that it optimizes for the workflow. Um, and again, most of that is, is at the level of, of pre-deployment to deployment. Your users, your creative shouldn't be thinking about that at that point. Really, it's just a matter of these are accessible drives with content on them and, and the performance will be there and the support for the protocols will be there as well. Courtney, you had a question? Yeah, I, I had a question. So, so as far as if I get this right, uh, there's the client has on-prem NAS that you may or may not specify or you your software then interoperates with. But you said there was a hybrid component uh, with uh, cloud-based systems. Does it, uh, does it always maintain the assets on the uh, client's NAS or are assets transferred into the cloud and accessed remotely uh, through your software and does your software manage uh, access permissions and security in that fashion? Yeah, th th those are great questions, and let me kind of break down those things in pieces. So yes, we, let, let's start with the, the simplest equation of, of on-prem hardware, and we have our software that is residing on, on that equipment, managing all of the, the capacity, the media. Um, and so in that instance, you, you've got uh, uh, local drives. We will also mount into the cloud. So if you've got S3 buckets, for example, we can mount those, uh, we can mount other storage systems. Um, so right there, you've spanned from on-prem to maybe something else that's on-prem or on-prem into the cloud. So we can do any of those combinations. 
But when and now you're speaking right to the heart of 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 my group and why why we exist within Open Drives, which is to say that's great. That kind of a setup where you've got data on prem, you've got data in the cloud. Is that a, a hybrid cloud situation? By the way, I also want to draw a distinction between hybrid cloud versus the types of on-prem equipment that they themselves can be hybrid in the type of storage media they have. So if I'm looking at a piece of uh, on-prem equipment, that may be all spinning disk, that may be all NVMe flash, or uh, we also support the flash and spinning disk hybrid on-prem equipment. So I want to just draw that distinction that that's hybrid more in the um, uh, capacity and the, the media used for it. And then we go beyond that to what I was saying about you may have data on-prem, you may have data in the cloud, and in a true hybrid sense, what you're really trying to achieve is where is the data? The data obviously should be closest to the user, most accessible to the user, and many times that's, that's in that on-prem uh, scenario. So what happens when data is less and less used in a project or at a certain point in the project? At some point, it makes more sense to have that in more economical uh, storage. That probably means that that could be pushed to the cloud. A true hybrid solution is going to affect automation, automation such that the decision making can, can happen automatically, that our software can look at that and go, this is not being used where most of the data needs to reside on-prem. Can we push that into a cloud environment uh, and maybe pull it back when it's requested again? That's really that holy grail of true hybrid connectivity. Uh, and that's what we're starting to focus on this year is a true hybrid class of software that not only sees data on-prem, not only sees it in cloud, but incorporates intelligence to help the users uh, access it and then move it automatically to a more economical layer of storage when it needs to be moved. And the, again, so that the creatives don't have to themselves think about that shift, but that the software is doing that for them. Engine, thank great. you. Uh, in, in Wellington, uh, New Zealand, we've got Adrian. You had a question there? Yeah, g'day Trevor, good to see you on. Hey, um, you've mentioned hardware partners a number of times. Do you have a compatibility list or are you completely hardware agnostic? Um, we are not completely hardware agnostic. Um, we had a question earlier, we were talking about um, you know, codecs and, and, and protocols, and because we support all types of workflows, whether you're talking about theatrical post all the way through to live broadcast, um, you know, where that's truly mission critical, there are so many aspects to the hardware platform that while we don't design it anymore, we leave that to the specialists. So, um, uh, one of our partners is Supermicro, so we, we let them do what they do best, but we know our software best, and so we will, we will take into consideration the preferences of our customers. Some customers like this vendor over that vendor, or maybe it just comes down to the hardware specs. And so when we realize that we need to support new hardware, we will run that through a very rigorous four-phase process to certify it. Once that platform is certified uh, by open drives, you can put any of our software tiers on that with assurances that it's not only going to function, but you're going to get the types of performance numbers that we can show. So the, to answer your question more specifically, it's not truly agnostic to the point that you can just grab equipment and say, give me your software, uh, which is named Atlas, and put it on there. <laughs> but amongst our supported compatible hardware, you can select either from a performance perspective or the price point perspective, the hardware that meets your organization's needs, meets your budgeting needs, um, and if it's certified by us, it's going to work great. And so you can contact us at any time and we'll walk you through what the hardware options currently are, what that roadmap looks like, and again, if there's any preference, we love to hear from our prospects and customers that, hey, what about this hardware over here from vendor X, we'll, we'll uh, start having discussions with them and take them through the process and try to certify that as quickly as possible. That's awesome, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. That's 
That was really good. Um, Trevor, I really appreciate just kind of diving into it a little more, um, particularly for us. You know, we're, we're all sitting at home. We appreciate that you've, you've come to our booth and we've be, been able to chat about this and we're excited about how uh, uh, we could see the software being used on NASA's that, we, that, that lots of our community are using. So thanks a lot, Trevor. Yeah, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it and all the great questions. That's great. Enjoy the show. Bye, all. Thank all you. All right. So now... Um, uh, you you could be you you you, it, you you could understand that it looks like Bill is outside, um, but what we're doing it looks like it's outside, but it's so bright because they're at the Godox booth. Um, it's so bright there; those lights are so bright that Bill has to wear sunglasses. Are you doing okay? Are you doing okay, Bill? Let's see. Hey, hey, Jameson. Uh, hey there. Oh, really good. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah, show us around. Our, our newest, largest fixture that's really cool. So follow me right over here. So this fixture right here is the all new Max 90. And it's basically a unit that's gonna project 2,600 watts of light, um, but it's gonna, gonna put the light into a five degree parallel beam so that that way you can shoot the light, can maintain the brightness for a long, long distance. Like we don't know how far just yet, but probably 200 yards or so. So that's really, really cool. It's gonna maintain the brightness. It's perfect for like bouncing light into cine reflectors, all kinds of fun stuff. Wow. So that's, that's, am, I coming, am I coming through okay? Yeah, it's working great. Working okay. great. Um, okay. So, okay, great. Yeah, and you can see me okay? Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you just fine. Yes. So you can see me because I'm lit with Godox lights. Um, so I've, nice. got, I, I've, got, <laughs> I've got five or six and the ones behind me. Um, and the cool thing about um, Godox is when, when I open up the app, when I search on my phone for the app, I just type in God. Because I'm evoking like the lighting gods, and then it comes up and there's God, and I put in the Godox, and then I, I start using the uh, the app. So what's what's super cool about Godox, it seems, is that you kind of have real sort of entry level availability of a whole bunch of your product line, right? And then what you were just showing us, super high end, like kind of movie, you know, movie uh, making uh, For sure. uh, fixtures as well, right? Yeah, we, we have an entire ecosystem. So beginners, intermediate filmmakers, and advanced filmmakers. So really what we have that we really want to showcase this year is our no-lead uh, lineup, which is basically our big, powerful light. Some of them are bicolor, some of them are RGB, but like we're coloring the whole spectrum of filmmakers on all levels. So I'll just, I'll walk you over and show you another new, new thing that's okay. really cool that I'm really excited about. So yeah. this right here is the... Uh, all new MG 1200R. So this is a 1200 watt RGB fixture. And uh, so you're gonna get all the functionality of a normal 1200 watt light, but you have full capability of all the RGB, all its effects, it's just crazy bright. I like it because you can make like a perfect magic hour or like that golden hour light and you can really fine tune exactly that color. It just gives you all the adjustments of a pro level light that you're looking for. Wow, so, when, you said, yeah. when you said no lead, I was like, N O lead? Like, what, what, are, we, what are you doing it's, uh, going backwards? Right. So, <laughs> yeah, no LED, no LED. So, yeah, there we go. Nice. That's, yeah, so that's, there's a lot of really, really cool, cool features. It's got all kinds of modifiers. Like, for instance, the big uh, beam light we just looked at, that Max 90, this is actually a mm -hmm. modifier that can go on uh, to these lights because we have the G mount, which is Godox's proprietary mount. So it's a mount that's sturdy enough, it's a smart mount, it has like an optics recognition system, so the light itself can communicate with your modifier. So lights are becoming very, very smart nowadays, and so it's just a really cool way that we can give you more functionality and more versatility out of your light. So, yeah, we can keep, uh, keep can bouncing you around and look through here. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, can you tell us about the control systems? Um, so as yes. I talked about before, the, the, the app and Bluetooth and obviously the network that it creates and, and doing that, yes. obviously you'd also go up into DMX and there'd be other... What's kind of the control systems you use across the, the, the range? So now we have what's, what's really exciting. We have the Godox Lite app that you can control all of the apps through Bluetooth from your phone. So... Uh, as long as it has a Bluetooth signal, you can control it, the flexibility. It's just really awesome to be able to see everything while you're behind the camera and be able to adjust and, and make the fine tune, you know, to really get that effect that you're going for. The other thing that we're really excited about is our all new No Lead app. So No Lead, there it is once again. This is an app for an iPad. And so if you have a light that's CRMX compatible, you can actually program uh, these lights within this new No Lead app on the iPad and control an entire array of them, regardless of the manufacturer. So you could actually cross-pollinate brands, put them all together on this app, and be able to utilize the functionality of a DMX board with this iPad. So you can do all kinds of fun stuff, from light mapping, if the light enables it, to um, basically, you name it, you have full controllability through one universal app. So that's what we're wow. really, really excited about. Very cool. Uh, I could show you a demo else? over here. I don't know how it's going to come through on, on the camera yeah. and the feed and everything, but... Yeah. Let's try. Let's try. That'd be great. Okay. Well, let's, let's, can we get the, uh, the light map up and running? Okay. They're going to get that set up. In the meantime, I'm going to show you more new stuff, and then we'll come right okay. back over to it. that cool? All right. Yeah, so let's go over great. and check out my favorite light. I'm super excited about this light, this next one. So let's go check it out. We'll come right through here. <laughs> Okay, right over here. We have a big booth this year, so there's a lot of stuff to look at. So hmm. this right here, this is the all new F800R. So this is a flexible panel light. You guys able to hear me okay? There's some, there's some sound over coming from behind me. Am I coming yep, through okay? No, we're all good. We're all good. Okay, great. So this is an F800R. It's an RGB panel light, so it's flexible. It's water resistant. It folds up and you can carry it in a really tiny carrying case, which is really, really cool. And the, the light itself is like very, very sharp. There's all kinds of modes, uh, all kinds of effects you can go through. And if you want just a really nice key light for like an interview setup, you have the, the capability to do that. But maybe you're you know, wanting to change it up and do something kind of fun, you need something kind of wacky, you can change the color and you can do some RGB with this as well. Um, we also have all kinds of diffusion options for it. You can Velcro this light to a wall. You can zip tie it. You can do all kinds of mounting options for it. Uh, it's just really cool. It's a really do-it-all light that you can use in any sort of environment. So whether you're in like a, a small studio apartment, a tiny you know, office or something, or a big you know, large studio with a psych wall, you can actually light up all kinds of stuff with this light. So wow. I'm really excited about the versatility of this particular unit right here. And does that, does that have the fireworks effect on that one as well? It absolutely <laughs> does. <laughs> but we're going to one-up those fireworks effects here in just a minute. I'm going to show you how you can actually map the fireworks into your scene, which is really cool, in real time. Oh. So okay, let me see if cool. they got it up and running. I think, are we good over here? Okay, we're going we're gonna to attempt it. So let's, let's experiment. Let's All see right. if this actually goes through the stream. So let's try. Okay, great. Thanks. So, okay, so... Are we standing in it right here? So I'll kind of give you a walkthrough of what this is. Can we turn the, the brightness up on this one? Oh, you want to be right here? Okay. So I need you to stand on this right here. We're doing this in real time. So this is real live right here. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's great. Okay. We're loving it. So Kylie is going to be our lovely model. She's got to get over here, though. On, yeah, this, this way. Two of them. And then go ahead and step on that. One more. Okay, so what we're looking at now is our map lighting projection. So what we have here is behind Kylie is a TV screen we set up just for demo purposes. But what's happening here is we're using our all new NOLED app and we're able to track the lights in the background as it's passing through. And the lights that are around our scene here are actually emulating each of those lights to make a more real environment. So it's almost like a live real time setting. So let me turn up the brightness so it shows up a little bit more. So. I'm able to, here, if you want to hit the screen right here, so this is the NOLED app right here, uh, right, right down here on the iPad. There you go, yeah. So right here I'm able to actually take the pixel information in each of these lights Whoa. and put them to like, if I want that red there, I want that pink there, 
I want this lamp right That's here. I want cool. those fireworks over there. Um, I want that neon over there. You can actually emulate the lights and you're communicating with them to reflect it in the environment onto your subject. So Super that's cool. just the future of like these panel lights and where the light mapping is, is headed, especially with this Godox light or the NOLED app. So it gives you full CRMX control. And this is the one that also is universal. So you can actually use other brands with CRMX capabilities as well. So it's really cool. So did that come through okay? <laughs> it ca that came yeah. through perfectly. That's super okay, cool. cool. Go, Kai. <laughs> How is he getting right, the video uh, into the iPad so that it can map it? I'm, I'm sorry, it didn't, it didn't come through. I didn't quite hear you. Can you say that one again? How did, how did the video get into the iPad to be able to map it? So we're able to import the video source that you have. Like if you have a video, you just import it into the app. The app is able to project it for you, it puts it up so you can monitor it in real time, and it's able to utilize that information for your projection mapping. Not only that, but we can also use, if you were to use the camera on the iPad itself, you can use live mode through the app, and if you just wanted to be walking around NAB here and emulate the lighting that's going on all around us, because it's pretty crazy itself, you can actually do that through the app as well, through the live function. So lots of capability and lots of really, really fun features. Wow. That, that's super cool. We're going we're gonna to move on uh, to our next booth, but thank you so much for showing us around, and you've done a great job of demoing. That was an awesome demo. Okay, um, you couldn't, awesome. Thank you, you guys. Might not have, you might not have seen all our faces, but we're, all our jaws dropped when, it was, <laughs> <laughs> when you were showing that. So great all work. Right. Thanks for spending some time with us, and have a great show. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Great work. So um, we... Uh, uh, we're going super quick today, um, which, are, which we're really loving. Um, all the panelists are we're on our on the edge of our seat as we get to the next booth. What we're doing now is we're going we're going to go back um, to uh, we're going we're, we're going to VizRT, which I'm super excited about. We we're talking about yesterday, so we're going to VizRT, um, and I think we've got Jonas is standing by um, to uh, ask uh, some some good questions of VizRT. Are you there, Jonas? Maybe. Hey, Grant. Thank you. Yes, we are here at the Visa T booth with uh, Jeremy and Justin, and we're going to talk not only what's new with the rebranding and the TriCaster, but also what's in the cloud and everything in between. Thanks for joining us. Ah, thank you for having me. So uh, tell us what's new with the TriCaster. So with the whole TriCaster product line, obviously there's been a rebranding. We are now Visa T. The new tech name has kind of gone away, but TriCaster is still known and loved and all around the world. We've added some new things this year to talk about on the TriCaster line, primarily TC Now. So this is our cloud version of the standard TriCaster. We can actually host this on our account, so it becomes like the TRY version of a TriCaster, kind of try and buy, kind of gets you into the vein of the cloud operation without having to go through all the extra added expense of being an AWS engineer. So we're able to do that nice and effectively. So with TriCaster now, you don't have to be hosting it yourself, building the instances. Correct. You give yourself the money right. and you do everything for the users. Right. So basically you're just launching into that application mm -hmm. on whatever desktop system that you're using, and that gets you into that cloud instance. And so some of the things that we're showing off here with my lovely assistant, Justin, <laughs> not only having the software on cloud, but we also have to talk about how we're getting signals up and back down from the cloud. So this is our new Tetra product. So this gets us the capability of having SDI in from a local connection or NDI. We also have NDI Bridge running on a single appliance. So now it's a one-stop shop for the application. Take in all the local baseband or local NDI signals, get them into a cloud infrastructure a lot easier than before. Then going the other direction, we also have our control surfaces. So this is our flex panel. So this is an NDI-based control panel which means I can connect up to anywhere on the NDI network, talk to any TriCaster on the NDI network, including ones in the cloud. So now we can decentralize our production and scale a lot more effectively. That's great. So when you were talking about your product to get uh, SDI to the cloud for TriCaster uh -huh. now, how much bandwidth do you need for like, let's say a uh, four camera shoot at uh, full HD? Well, we can, we can dynamically adjust the mm -hmm. bandwidth depending on the internet connectivity. So that's also part of the horsepower of Bridge. So you're not fixed on bandwidth per signal. Because the other cool thing with NDI, it's basically the only true bi-directional protocol. So I can mux signals through one port that's being forwarded 
up back down again. So that makes bandwidth not so much of an issue like other protocols are taking advantage of because of the, the added up of the frequencies. So we can do it a lot more effectively and scale a lot easier. Can it also handle if you have like unreliable-ish networks with packet loss right, and all that? Right, because you can change the encoding bandwidth size. Mm -hmm. You know, I can crank it all the way up to 50 if I want, or if I got not enough good enough service, I can knock that down into the four and five range of megs. That's great. So, and How it will many maintain quality. Can it do? So on this box, we've got four connections. Mm -hmm. So we can actually, in software, make them either 3G SDI or 12G. Mm -hmm. So that means four 4K signals can now come in. And then, depending on the configuration, right now, you can either do it as a 2 and 2 or a 4 and 0 mm -hmm. out, 3 and 1, whatever combination. Yeah. It's in software. Mm -hmm. So again, we're not forcing you into one type of yeah. workflow. You can be adjustable depending on your production. And then Bridge then muxes all those signals up to the cloud and then to come back down again. So how are you remotely controlling your TriCast in the cloud with the panel here? So the panel is connected via NDI through the Bridge connection. Mm -hmm. So now when you talk about from a reliability standpoint, I'm pressing the button on the control surface and changing the sources in a cloud environment. Yeah. And you can see how quick the response time is based on the NDI connectivity. And what are you using to bring the interface and uh, multi-views down? So that's coming back down. So Justin can answer that a little bit more on how we're doing it right now in this application. Okay. All right. So the way that uh, TriCasters run through is uh, it's about a five-minute setup. And then for deploying and creating that virtual machine, you're looking at about 15 minutes. Uh, so first time 20, every time they're after 15. It's pretty, pretty fast. It's pretty fast, yeah, especially to create this entire TriCaster in the cloud. I mean, it's already a very powerful utility. Uh, so as part of that launch pad, uh, it's going to launch nice DCV. So mm -hmm. anyone that's already working in uh, Amazon Web Services, you're going to be very familiar with yeah. that. Uh, part of that launch pad is we're also going to give you quick access to NDI Bridge. It'll automatically launch that on your workstation. And it carries the encryption key that you've designated in your TriCaster that's Now instance. Nice. So when you log in at any of your satellite locations, it, you're just set. You're ready to go. So you can lean on the keyboard, make it whatever characters yeah. you want. Because uh, it is 256-bit encrypted in that bridge connection. That's great. Uh, and, of course, it's cloud, so a lot of our TriCaster Power users are very familiar with Live Panel. So you'll be very happy to know that you can still tap into Live Panel through this Nice DCV instance. So uh, Live Panel just works through Nice DCV, or is there also a way to it use launches, it with HTML? So we intelligently launch this in a captive interface. So it emulates a web browser. It's not Nice DCV, but it runs Sidecar. That's part okay. of our... That's part of our TriCaster now launchpad utility. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's a breeze. And is that something that I can share with other users then through the launchpad? Yeah. So like Absolutely. All you would do is you would set up that launchpad on these other locations and then log in because, of course, it's two factor authentication. Yeah. You don't want anyone touching your cloud. Um, slap the wrist. Uh, but yeah, at that point, you're logged in, you have access to it. That's great. And if you want to, like, what all ways do you have to get sources in? Like, do you have IP, NDI? The alphabet soup of IP, my friends. So we, of course, we have a, a preference for NDI. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder why. Uh, but we I also wonder why, too. That's... Uh, but we also support SRT, RTMP, HTML5 graphics all in the cloud. Is there a way to get... Uh, we, I know our community does a lot of Zoom uh, productions. Is there a way to get some Zoom pins into it? Uh, Jeremy, you might be able to better answer that one, but I actually don't believe that's in the current iteration. All right, it was very loud in here, so I wasn't able to hear that question. So we were just talking about what sources you all can get into TriCaster now. Uh -huh. And since a lot of our community does a lot of uh, production with Zoom, we were wondering if there's a way to get uh, Zoom into the mix. Uh, through the cloud, yes, it's possible. Um, we got to take some extra steps to pull it off um, in the cloud environment. Yeah. Now, obviously, we've had TriCasters with on-prem capability doing that for a long, long time. You know, TC1 Pro, the TriCaster 2 Elite, those can have Zoom running on the TriCaster itself, mm -hmm. which is a very cool way to do yeah. it. And we're actually doing extraction per caller. So if I've got four or nine people on a Zoom call, I can actually bring them in as independent sources mm -hmm. for that production. Cloud's a little bit different right now okay. on the TC Now. Extra steps. However, if you want to go to the Vectar Plus cloud instance, mm -hmm. yes, that does have live call connect capability, but that's our higher end, 44 input. That's, a, that's our big boy. But do you also so like that's also available as like a managed product? Not only do you need to host it yourself? Uh, with Vectar, that is, yeah, you are hosting it yourself. You do have your own AWS instance. Those usually reserved for like our top tier one kind of broadcast clients. And we actually got a question. Let me uh, find it in all the tabs that I have. Sure, open. ask away. 
Yeah. So we have a lot more to talk about. So. <laughs> yeah. Guy Cochran from Seattle, USA, asks, uh, do you have to open up firewall ports on-prem to use NDI sources with NDI bridge? Uh, yes and no. Depends on where you're at. So mm -hmm. the way the bridge instance runs, we've got a host mode and a join mode. Mm -hmm. So the only place where you have to do the port forwarding, it's, it's one port to forward, yeah. on the host site. So whatever site you designate as the host, that's the one that you set up the port forwarding on. All the join sites, all you need is to log in with that encryption. So like if we're using cloud, we're going to designate that as host? Right. The, the cloud is the host instance, so every local on-prem site, that just becomes a join so mode. So that point, no port forwarding, Correct. nothing. It's all legit, yep. right. simple traffic. You can use it wherever. Correct. Yep, exactly. Great. Yeah, so let's go on. All what, right. What so. else is new? <laughs> uh, we've got some sports stuff we've been talking about if you want to get into that. Um, but what we're still doing right now, our camera that's kind of doing a little this stuff on its own, moving around the screen, <laughs> we're demoing right now our Virtual Studio Go application. So this is a great way to bring in XR, AR, mm -hmm. graphic content in a corporate environment. Yeah. Because we're talking about a single camera shot. We've got the free D over NDI, which no one else can do. So again, free D technology over NDI. Mm -hmm. So it's one cable still for yeah. the connectivity. So then we get into the interface where we can set up that shot. We can set up where the graphics are going to go, and then where we're going to lay out that on the screen. So this is in the augmented reality environment. This will also work in a virtual set environment. Mm -hmm. So a full-on site, green screen wall, we can handle that as well. So if you use that camera for your corporate gigs, you already have the tracking built in. You can use VisaT uh, Studio Go. So the way this is deployed right now, the Virtual Studio Go only works with our PTZ3 mm -hmm. UHD Plus camera. That's the one that we're showing off yep. right here. Uh, we will have the not only just the free D capability, but also the facial recognition tracking. Mm -hmm. So kind of two different angles yeah. we can do this with. So right now, the lens file and everything like that is doing more of the automation. Mm -hmm. If you want to run it by yourself in a completely manual yeah. or have the facial recognition take over, we can kind of talk about that and massage that into that workflow. So there's a couple different angles we can approach with that. But right and now we're set up um, for the lens filing and everything like that just with our camera. Great. And does that, uh, can you have multiple of those cameras or like the two shots or so right now? The way one? right now in this first deployment, because yeah. again, this is a brand new product that we've been talking about, the Virtual Studio Go is a single camera. Mm -hmm. There are provisions to do multiple systems. Mm -hmm. So if you need two cameras yeah. and two environments, so basically you have two systems running in parallel and then you're switching camera sources, those outputs, they can feed into the TriCaster mm -hmm. for the production. Great. So there is a way to do it. Awesome. What else so, is new? All right. So uh, a couple years ago, we actually bought a uh, software company called Flowix. So that's HTML5-based graphics. So one of the things that we're doing right now from the Flowix interface, we really highlight the data connection points. Where's my content coming from? It's not just graphics that are created in Photoshop or whatever. Mm -hmm. We can actually template this, layer base it, and then output an HTML link anywhere from the world. I just got to log in from the from a browser. There's yeah. no client software to load, anything like that. And then I was bringing that link into the DSKs of the TriCaster. So graphics can be run by a separate operator anywhere on the planet. Then we can layer that. We can add in the telemetry data, social media fees. We can curate those lists so it's not just wild, whatever shows up. We can pick out different tag areas, and then those become part of the graphic on air and a custom template, so it doesn't have to be like a screen grab. We can actually make it brand appropriate. And is it something that uh, Flowix already does for you, like the connecting to the different networks, or do you, like with other solutions, need to bring your own API key, or is that not the right. case? Right, uh, so we've got a wide range of mm -hmm. embedded connections that have already been established because of the years of yeah. development that Flowix has been doing. But if you have a custom one, there is a path to then create that custom data connection point from our engineers. But like if I need to, uh, want to show some YouTube comments, I don't need to go into the API, I can just use Flowix. Right, because the data connection points have already been established, you're pretty much setting up your parameters, mm -hmm. and then what your design looks like, then it will then fill that area, and then also the control aspect of it. So we've got a control layer. So this is the curation, so the rundown. Mm -hmm. So if you want multiple different feeds to run yeah. like on a loop constantly, you can set up that playlist, and then that will play out on air. So those, I mean, making all hours on this. So. Yeah, that's great. As someone who had to uh, battle through API connections and all that to right. get some YouTube comments in, that is uh, a great yeah, feature. Yeah, it aids in the interactivity yeah. of what you're doing because, yes, you're just outputting a standard video feed, 
you don't know who's actually watching. This actually yeah. gives feedback back to the people on air to say, hey, people are actually paying attention or asking questions. That's great. What else? <laughs> you have to show. What else? All right. Uh, it's so almost we, like I can't be satisfied. It's like, what else do you have? I, how much time do I got on air? We got a big booth here. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so that's kind of the basic stuff in this application, in this pod. We've got several other pods that have a lot of other cool toys that we're showing off. And to the sports side, we do have our data analytics and our post-game show commentary, if you will, with Libro Go. That's a simplified version of our larger production that you know Premier League uh, Soccer and everybody else uses for yeah. all that object tracking and stuff. Um, we have a simplified version now that's designed for our channel business, uh, colleges, universities, yeah. regional sports networks, things like that. We're showing that off. On the back side of some of these, um, which they're in use right now on a demo, uh, we have our larger flex dual panel. Mm -hmm. So if you think about this one with the single yeah. stripe, we have a much larger panel with two stripes, 24 cross points per stripe, mm -hmm. that we can talk to any of our higher level TriCasters, yeah. the TC1 Pro, the TriCaster 2 Elite, the Vectar. Again, same idea. You're connecting via NDI mm -hmm. anywhere on the NDI network, which means I could switch back and forth between different TriCasters. Yeah. Or I can have multiple panels talking to the same TriCasters. Now I have dual operator control. And with NDI Bridge, they can also be wherever they need to Complete, be. Right. Studios in Chicago, you've got an operator in New York, you got another operator in Atlanta. And I'm guessing the bandwidth requirement for just control is relatively low. Yeah, it's relatively low, and it's, it's utilized on that NDI control layer. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's not really accessible by anything else either. Yeah. So that also kind of prevents like the intrusion aspect of yeah. someone taking over because nothing else can really see it's that. Not like path. you can just send a TCP command and message. Right. Yeah. No. It's, yeah. It's not going to happen. Um, so that also helps in those hybrid environments. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a large, you know, concert or something like that, where you're controlling the content on the video walls as well as doing the live broadcast. Yeah. Now, from one TriCaster, I can have two operators doing two completely different aspects of the show. Does it work with the router? Like, could you have a router destination and two inputs that are two different panels, then route which panel you are panel well, is controlling? Well, because all the, eh, kind of, yes, I can relabel and rename. So that's the other kind of cool thing. That's a good thing you brought that up, because I forgot about that aspect. When I go through the naming convention on the panel, I can then pick and choose which inputs I'm talking about. So then that becomes a user level control. That's great. So if I only want inputs one through eight on this one and nine through 16 on another, I can map that accordingly. Mm -hmm. So now you can have two panels that control different inputs. They don't have to be Correct. the same. Correct, yes. It's great. Do we have some more questions? Nothing else? Okay, I'll keep no. talking. Yeah. yeah, another cool little product um, that's more for the AV space, mm -hmm. but we still want to show it off here at NAV is a wonderful product called Capture Cast. So originally designed for lecture capture, we've kind of taken it a little bit further, and we can even combine that in a TriCaster instance where you just need direct recording. Mm -hmm. So say if you've got several different rooms yeah. that you don't need an operator for, I can still then ingest all that content, aggregate that, and then send that off wherever I need to. Yeah. We have the connections for Panopto and Kaltura and things like that. Uh, great space in the education market. We've also been able to talk about how we could use this in municipalities. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about city council meetings, yeah. you might have the main production where you have to do a switched production of the city council meeting, but maybe zoning or liquor borders. Another meeting is going on down the hall that still has to be recorded and broadcast, but I don't need an operator. So I have one of our cameras with an XLR input. I take the room audio, feed it to the camera. The camera then feeds into CaptureCast, and then that does the micro broadcasting out to wherever you need to. So CaptureCast is a really cool product. Uh, you will see more of that at Infocom. <laughs> we'll be yeah. talking about that more uh, in a few months. But yeah, lots of other things and cool toys we got going so on here. So is CaptureCast a product that runs like on hardware, on software? It's, it's a hardware different. box. So it's right. a it's an NDI-based platform. It's headless, so it sits in a network closet yeah. somewhere. You aggregate your NDI inputs, and then you're controlling it just from the web GUI. That's great. Does that also, so like you could have multiple rooms with multiple of your PTZs, uh -huh. you can do AR if you want to do it with the, what's it gonna? We can, we, we're getting to the track, the, yeah, yeah. The, the facial recognition tracking capabilities. Um, so we will have more command and control. Yeah. We can tie this into, you know, a Crestron room scheduling system or things like that, where it'll automate the process and it'll do the actual windowing. We can even set this up if you've got four different camera or sources yeah. going into CaptureCast, but then you're outputting it to say to Panopto, where you can actually user select which camera angle the user wants to see. That's a great way then to interface with that. So now, from the user's perspective, they can control what content they want to look at because all yeah. four signals are available live at the same time. 
But at the same time, if you then want to bring all rooms together or bring it up into the cloud, you can use NDI Bridge, bring them Going all back up. the other way. Oh, yeah. We That's can get great. a lot of fun with this. So you can, uh, <laughs> from the smallest one, just record it to, hey, we need to uh, bring all the rooms together. That is all together. What's your favorite product that you're showing? This week, uh, the Tetra, I think, is my favorite one so far. Just because we've been working and asking for you know, the bridge box yeah. for a long time. So now we actually have direct ingest from a hardware perspective, from a video signal perspective, and having bridge running on the same product. So Tetra takes the SDI feed in and creates NDI feeds. Can you also yes. use those just on the network? Or is yes, it just it, it'll also work on the local. So if you've got you know, a decentralized production, multiple different rooms on the same building, mm -hmm. the same floor, but you still need to have that baseband connectivity, yeah, Tetra is a great little product. So like somewhere. we could drop Tetra in every single breakout room, use uh, capture cast to record it when we don't want to do a lot of production, but Correct. also could send it up with it to the cloud whenever we need it. Right, because it's NDI, I have that dual path capability. So I can keep it local, I can keep it simple, and then when necessary, those same signals are available to do live production switching. And Tetra can also just pick up NDI sources or like control right. sources like that. So it's basically uh, NDI bridge in the box, plus you get some SDI IO. Yeah, it's the Cloud Swiss Army knife for us. Yeah. On prem especially. There's some other cool stuff with audio routing, so we can remux your audio if yes. necessary. Uh, so that's a cool little feature we that's have. Really neat. So now we can pick and choose. It's a 16-channel audio router that's built in per input. Do you have any audio inputs? Oh, yeah, we can do NDI audio as well because that's across the network. That's I can awesome. run Dante. I can run all kinds of stuff. Great. And with that, uh, back to you, Grant. Awesome. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, amazing seeing um, Vizard T. Uh, and the the progression of what's happened with the TriCaster, um, we, we've spoken a couple of times in the last couple of days about TriCaster, um, and and we even mentioned the toaster, the the video toaster way back when, and and then the SD version of the TriCaster, and um, it's awesome to see what's going on in the cloud, and so we're looking forward to um, office hours even messing around a little bit with some vector um, in the cloud and seeing what we can do. I think it's going to be uh, an exciting time. So, from VizRT, we're going now down uh, to to Jason, who's in the field, and we're looking at, is it Nisi or N Nisi filters? Which one is it? Nisi, and boy, this Nisi. call looks fantastic. So, yes, I, I, <laughs> I would like to introduce to the panel Jim Reisman uh, with Nisi. How are you? Hey, well, hey. Ed, welcome, to the, Ed, welcome, welcome to the Nisi booth. At NAB, Thank you. It's, Las Vegas, 2024. Look so, at that! Um, it's great to be. It's great to be here. Um, I, I'm sitting in Adelaide, South Australia, so it's a, it's amazing for for you to uh, accommodate us uh, at your booth. Um, I'll I'll let you go into your spiel. Tell us about what you've got there at the booth. Okay. Well, our booth. This is our second year. This is our second year at NAB. Last year at NAB, we brought lenses to the market that we just knew that they were going to be five lenses that were going to be true cinema prime lenses. It was a 14 millimeter, a 25 millimeter, a 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, and an 85 millimeter. What we were promised was that these five lenses would A, be all matched in terms of size and weight and control attributes so that if you were a gimbal user or a rig user, you could change the lenses out on the fly and not have to rebalance your gimbal. Well, that's good enough right there. But the next thing is, is that we were promising incredible optical attributes on these lenses. And these lenses are uh, US dollars, about $1,200 a lens on average. So the lenses were supposed to be able to give um, incredibly neutral, clean, sharp images so the lenses could truly be used with any, uh, any digital camera and produce a result that would allow the user to use these lenses in any, order, in any kind of situation. These are not lenses that, are, uh, that have any sort of character to them or have any sort of thing about them that you, you kind of have to accept in order to use the lenses. They are sharp. They have not only met our expectations, they have exceeded our expectations. 
So let me run down some of the basic features for you. First of all, good clean primes, 300 degree rotation of the helicoid so you're very easy to follow focus, capture critical focus, and see a nice smooth fall off to any uh, out of focus uh, uh, aspects of the image, you know, whether it's uh, uh, the bokeh of the image or just the out of focus uh, aspect of the image. The next thing was is that the lenses, when focused, rack back and forth in focus, have no visible focus breathing. So for a lens that costs this amount of money to, to deliver no focus breathing is another incredible uh, aspect of the lens. The lens has virtually no chromatic aberrations to it. The colors are clean. There's no color fringing in the highlights. They're excellent in that regard. The lenses have an aspect to them called micro contrast control, which I had no idea what that meant a year ago. But what it means is, is that the lenses are tuned so that they will retain detail from shadow to highlight and, and maintain more detail in them than any other lens, not only in their category, but in lenses that cost three to four times their price. Uh, the, other, the other attribute of the lenses is that all the lenses, except for the 14, can take 77 millimeter front filters, and all of the lenses that we've introduced to date can take rear mount filters, whether they're drop-in filters in the fixed mount lenses, which are our Leica L, our Sony E, and our Canon RF. They have drop-in filters. Our PL filter, our PL lenses have rear screw-in filters. So you can actually still use neutral density filters behind the lens. You just have to take the lens off, unscrew the filters, and screw the neutral density filters in. So that, that's all old news. That's all yesterday's news. Today's news, and I'm going to come over here. Yeah. Show, show is that we have, that'd be great. That we have a range of lenses here. We're going to have to, I might actually have you cheat around all the way to there. Hopefully that didn't make anyone seasick. No, and that was we have perfect. a range of nice lenses. Move. Good. <laughs> uh, we have added an 18 millimeter, a 40 millimeter, and a 135 millimeter to the range. So we now have eight lenses. Of the eight lenses, seven of the lenses still have that matched weight control uh, attribute to them. The 135 is a little bit longer, a little bit heavier, but really in a very, very minor way. So it just requires a little bit of adjustment. And why a 135? Why an 18? Why a 40 between these lenses? because this is what came back to us from the users who's, who bought our lenses. You know, God, we love your lenses. Man, would you please make a 40 millimeter? Made a 40 millimeter. That 14's a little too wide and 25's not quite wide enough for us. There's an 18. 135 was so highly requested by us that we broke the uh, aspect of, of making sure all, that all the lenses were of the same weight and size. So the 135 is a little bit of a break away from that, but the lens is just phenomenal. And hopefully at this point we can, um, do we, have, we have the 135 here. I'm gonna ask one of my people, hold on one sec. Can we get okay. the monitor on there? Can you okay. get the model on the, mo on the lens and show what this can do and show the, f show the focus breathing by the way, Adelaide, he's from Australia. Oh, dear. Nice. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> wow, look at that. That looks great. Um, lenses are phenomenal. To be yeah, able yeah. to buy a set of lenses, to be able to buy a set now of eight lenses for $9,000 is an incredible value. It's, it's mm. just an, an absolute incredible value. Uh, by the way, we're, me, we're represented in the United States by all of the major retailers in the United States. We also have a uh, very robust network in Australia. The gentleman who was just helping me 
is, mm -hmm. is our Sydney-based representative, and, uh, and we're an international company. Now, the only other things that I wanted to make sure that you know about is, is first of all, let's, um, let me step, I'm gonna, you stay here, I'm gonna step right over here. <laughs> we'll stay right here. <laughs> I don't wanna keep, I don't, I don't want, but we also Don't go introduced, anywhere, Grant, don't go anywhere, stay right there. Don't go anywhere, <laughs> we'll you stay better here. stay there, and there better be more <laughs> we'll than you <laughs> But we have a PL to PL 2X adapter, 2X mm. extender. So we have a 2X extender that we, uh, we have designed and it only loses one T-stop of light. So you can essentially get a 270 millimeter 3.8 lens where all, with all of the optical characteristics of the original lens without the converter. This is a prototype. It will be on the market. It'll probably be with us in, uh, in August or September but this is coming to market. The other things that are coming to market are, I will uh, drag you over here real quick. All right, I just want to get a is, quick question in from, from Adrian um, in Wellington. Go ahead, Adrian. Hey, Jim, thanks for having us. Hey, just a quick question. I noticed that you're supporting RF lenses. I'm a Canon shooter, so I'm very pleased to see that because there's very few non-Canon RFs out there. Just interested in your thinking behind that rather than EF or EF as well? Well, keep in mind we support several, you know, most of the major cameras that are used. We have Canon RF, Sony E, Leica L, Fujifilm GFX 100. And if you catch what I'm saying there, that means we're using a, a supersized sensor on there. We have a 46 millimeter rear circle of uh, illumination. So we can handle VistaVision. We can handle medium format uh, sensors with no loss of sharpness and no loss of quality. What, what, level of, what level of communication do you have between the RF lenses and the Canon bodies? Absolutely nothing. They are okay. dumb lenses. They have no DX uh, or meta, <laughs> meta information going back before them. So you know what? Bring a notepad with you. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you so much. Okay. Yep. Jim, Jim, we're going okay. to cut it off there. Um, thank you. That, it's awesome to see and, and a great price, price point is what you're talking about. We're going we're gonna to oh, jump I'm, across to a, another booth now, but thank you so much, Jim. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. <laughs> no worries. Care. Bye. Bye-bye. So we're, we're going from uh, out in those booths to back to our booth um, where we've got uh, David McGraven, um, who is uh, the CEO of Maxon. Um, and uh, hello, David. You got us there? Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Thank, it's thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, we keep doing this, uh, all these little interviews, and every time, every time it works so well, we're just like, oh, this is great. Uh, <laughs> here I am, just sitting at home in Adelaide, South Australia, and I'm able to um, able to speak with you. Thank you for coming by. Um, d tell me b before we get right into um, some of the new um, services and, and things that you have. Um, I just wanted to hear quickly because I, I believe you've got quite a long history in Adobe. Is, is that right? And that, and that kind of led you into here? Is, is that right? Yeah, I started actually with Adobe back in 1998, which is kind of hard to believe that it's been that long. I spent 20 years there, most of that time in the video division. So I was an engineer by trade. So I was programming on Premiere 5.1b, I think, before it was pro. So yeah, it was wow. 20 years at Adobe. So yeah, it was, it was a while. And then how is that um, led into Maxon, and, and then what have we, what have we got today? Like, a, a, you know, a quick, a, a quick uh, overview of that. Yeah, it is um, actually quite an accident. I was I never wanted to be a CEO. I never knew anything about business. Um, I was programming on you know Premiere. I was just a lowly but enjoyable time programming, doing some great stuff with Adobe. is a great place to work. And I slowly was working up, um, you know, through management and, you know, getting bigger teams. But at the same time, I met a lovely woman who was from Germany. So I was, I moved to Germany and was there for about eight years. And then we came back and then we went back to Germany. And, you know, in that time, I decided I wanted to stay in Germany. And then, you know, Maxon actually contacted me through a network of people that knew me at Adobe and then recruited me to work at Maxon, which was amazingly perfect because I was just about an hour away where I was living in Germany, so I didn't have to move, and it was just a 
perfect accident. And at the time, the three original founders of Maxon was retiring, and the parent company, um, which is down in Munich, was trying to convince me to be CEO, um, which was kind of mind-boggling because I really had no idea what I was getting into. Um, no expectation of what the job meant or what I was going to do. I knew a bit about Maxon because they're a great partner with Adobe. We worked really closely with them. So I knew some of the people there and I knew um, the products, of course, but I was definitely not a 3D expert, but at least the same customer segment. So going, going into that role was um, wild. It's been almost six years now. Um, so it's been, it's been a great run. I've really enjoyed it. I mean, the, the people at Maxon are spectacular. We've been growing like crazy, so we're getting bigger and bigger. Um, so we got a lot more Maxonians out with us now doing great stuff. That's amazing. So uh, help our audience kind of understand, I think most of our audience would be familiar with Cinema 4D or at least heard the, the, the term, the software. Um, but Maxon is quite bigger than just, than just 4D, right? Well, so when I got to Maxon, it was pretty much mostly focused on Cinema 4D. They had various versions on the market, so they had Cinema 4D for broadcast or Cinema 4D Complete, and they had one for architecture. But it was really truly CD, Cinema 4D focused, and the, the CTO of Maxon right now was the original guy who wrote it, and so it was really you know, all about Cinema 4D and all the tools. But as I got there and I was talking to people and getting to know the market, we really wanted to make sure that Maxon had more tools that can serve our artists, and it was sort of a great time in the industry. And we met a number of other companies that shared the culture, shared the customer set, and wanted to work together to do something bigger. So we've brought in, um, I think, a total of six different companies since I've been there. So it's been quite wild. Um, the first year, we had already um, brought in Redshift, which is the, uh, the fastest GPU-based ray tracer on the market. And so it was a small group of um, guys, three guys founded that company, and they joined us already back in 2019. And since then, we brought in Red Giant and then ZBrush in the last two years, plus a couple smaller things. And so it's been a really, you know, not knowing how to be a CEO, trying to figure out how to acquire companies was another level of um, experience needed. Um, but it's, it's been amazing because the, the employees at all the companies, you know, grew up in the motion graphics industry. They know each other through different events. They share the same customers. They share the same ideas. And so it's actually been really nice because they've really fit well together. So now we're a company over 350 people. We're in five different countries. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been quite a run. So yeah, so we have a total of five products now in what we call Maxon One, which is our complete um, subscription solution for motion graphics and 3D content. And so that subscription shift, um, did that happen in your time? Um, as in, you know, it was something that was a, it's a big shift in the industry, right, to move to subscription? Yeah, um, I mean, it was obviously what, yeah, that was obviously one of the reasons that they, you know, they, they liked my history because I knew about that, obviously, through the Adobe time, for better or worse, depending on who's asking the question. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, from from my point of view, it was great, right? Like as a as a freelancer, you know, messing around um, with Adobe products, it was like I can't afford the thousands and thousands of dollars to to pay it out, but I can I can work out a monthly subscription, um, and so, uh, but that that shift would have been an interesting thing to to move to, and generally, have your clients been accepting of that? Oh, I mean. The, what you said is absolutely right. I mean, I didn't do it because I'm some capitalist, as some people might think about, right? But when I got to Maxon, if you wanted to get into Cinema 4D, you had to drop something like $3,400 plus a $650 service agreement. So if you wanted to start to be a new um, 3D artist, you had to drop $4,000. And you didn't know if that was going to be your career or not. You didn't know how hard it was going to be. And that just isn't the way I look at the world. I mean, I think when Adobe did it, they did it right. How do you take great software, you know, find the right point that people can actually use it and experience it and learn it without putting their house, you know, up for mortgage or something like that. So we've dropped the price drastically. We went from $4,000 to get started to at the time, I think it was 65 euros or something a month. Um, and now with, um, you know, with Maxon One, you get all of these products, you know, for less than, you know, something like $100 a month. I don't have all the prices in my head, but really just broke that barrier of entry. So obviously you had some people 
you know, who are maybe mistrusting or they think we're doing it for lock-in. You have the people who don't like it, but the majority of our customers have really embraced it. And Maxon's gone through tremendous growth in that time because it's much more accessible to many more people. You can really get in there as a freelancer and learn the software and experience it without, you know, spending, you know, especially for all those products, you'd have to drop a lot, so. Well, and pushing out updates and things when, whenever you want to, rather than that, you know, being tied to some sort of pricing model or something. That, obviously, that's a huge advantage too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we, you know, we switched from I think it was probably a, you know, for some of the products, eighteen month cycles. We now release something every single month. Some of them are great feature updates, like what we're doing here at NAB. But other times, we're just releasing our, um, what we call capsules, which is our asset library. They have, you know, materials or three D objects or you know, plants that you can use in your scenes or really smart capsules, we can bring those out every single month and just always give people something great. We're always putting new training out so that people can learn all the new features. And it's really about, you know, being able to react fast, get the customers what they need. If we get feedback, we can roll something much faster and not wait for that 18 18 month development cycle that we used to have to deal with as, you know, programmers where we had to wait a long time to get our stuff into people's hands. Yeah, well. And back when you started, it was on <laughs> floppy disks and things as well, right? Yeah, there's some stories there, yeah, where we had to, I think I, it was something like a 36-month release cycle, and I remember one time we released it and had to like pull back floppy disks that had gone on around the world. It was yeah, a different time. Things have changed a, a little bit. World. Yeah, a little bit. So can you tell us about one uh, and, and tell us like what, what, what do people get? What do you get when, yeah. you, when you subscribe to one? So with Maxon One, you get everything we make. So it comes with um, Cinema 4D, Redshift, Red Giant, ZBrush, Forger, which is our iPad sculpting app. Um, It comes with Capsules, which is our asset library. There's thousands and thousands of assets and we're adding new ones every month. It comes with free training, it comes with support. Um, So it's basically everything that we have at Maxon across all of the customers we serve. And you can get it, just download it really quick and get started. That's great. I've got a question from Seattle and Guy. What's your question? Yeah, I was just uh, doing a search on YouTube for for what was live at NAB and you guys popped up and wow, congrats on the amount of uh, eyeballs that are watching and the chat. Uh, What is it at the boot that's been uh, such a big hit? Because you're getting seven, eight thousand views um, from yesterday's uh, live and what's going on there today. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in the boot? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've been doing live streams, luckily, since before Corona at NAB, which helped us, obviously, when we all had to go remote. So we have a history of doing that. But Maxon, you know, we're really a community-based company. We have an amazing set of artists who love us, work with us, teach us what we need to do because, you know, we're engineers. They need to help us create the tools they need. So we bring in amazing artists to hang out with us here at NAB. So we have something like 16 or 20 different artists who are live every day presenting their workflow, how they use our products. And this time it's also lovely because we've got an amazing new release. We have updates to almost all of our products. And it's probably one of the best reviewed releases we've had, at least since I've been at Maxon, but for a very long time. So specifically, we brought out um, brand new GPU accelerated particle workflows inside of Cinema 4D. It's probably the highest requested feature we've had. But it's based on about two years worth of work where we've been adding new GPU simulation framework. We call it Unified Simulation. Two years ago, I think, if I get the time right, we brought out um, Pyro, which is fire and smoke. We then added soft body simulation. Then we added rigid body simulation to that. And now we've just brought out particles. And you can put this all together, and they all work together super fast in the GPU. And people are just really excited about it. And almost all the artists picked it up. We released it about five days ago. And they're already demoing in their workflows because they've needed it. It's got amazing workflows. You can do it really easy in the object manager. It's got flocking and predator prey, and you can just set up really complex um, particle workflows, but really easy inside the object manager. And it's really just gone like crazy, and I think everybody's tuning in to see what's going on there. Um, Another top, top feature was in Redshift. People have been asking for years. Redshift was a photorealistic renderer, and they put all their work into making it photorealistic. But uh, the top feature request was the opposite, do non-photorealistic rendering. So we brought out tune rendering in this release as well. So now you can do really highly stylized tune rendering in Redshift. And again, it was a top feature request. So those things are just causing a ton of buzz at the show. And there's just, you know, it's been great. There's lots and lots of people hanging out with us. We got our party tonight. So it's been, we, we always love coming back to NAB, so. That's so cool. Can you tell me about, like, you support, I think, three platforms, right? Mac, PC, and Linux. Um, so, how do how do you manage that? And I'm interested in things like with the M series um, uh, processors in the Mac, 
um, you know, there's a bunch of advancements in that. But I also on the PC and, and with, with um, dedicated graphics and, and things like that, how do you manage that across a different platform? <laughs> Luckily, I don't have to anymore. Now, it, it, <laughs> I was still programming when I left Adobe, but I'm not allowed to program at Maxon. It's the one thing they won't let me do. Um, right. But it's actually, it was actually slightly more complicated than that. So we actually have our main products on Mac and Windows. On Linux, we do support um, rendering. So we have rendering services on Linux, but we don't have the user experience. But what's actually much more complicated than that is the GPU. And so when we brought in Redshift, it was an NVIDIA-only, Windows-only solution. I guess, I guess Windows and Linux, but NVIDIA-based CUDA. So what we've actually done is the, the main lift, because the applications you can kind of manage, but the main lift of moving across different platforms is the GPU technology. So with Redshift, we started a fee, um, process called Redshift Everywhere. So we ported it from CUDA to Metal, um, Metal to HIP. We have it running on the CPU now. It was GPU only at the time, but now we run it on the CPU. Um, so now we can really run it on any computer, on any graphics stack. And it was, yeah, it was quite a lot of work. Um, the team has been amazing. They've worked on an abstraction layer, so we do it ourselves. And um, they've been able to make it so that they can now write their shaders anywhere and it'll basically run on any of those GPU platforms. So that's been the heaviest lift, but it's even more exciting than that. Um, we've also started um, moving some of our tools to the iPad. So we have, um, we've sneaked it. We're not talking about it yet, so I won't tell you too many secrets, but um, we've, we've shown that we're bringing ZBrush fully native to the iPad. So we're also gonna be going on to more platforms than that. Wow, that's amazing. So then an extension to that, I guess, is how people are, you know, how your customers are using the product and, and exciting new platforms potentially in VR and, and things like the Vision Pro. And are you seeing some sort of, you know, crossover and use of that? Um, I think the cool thing is because of the way our software works, um, our workflows are kind of already set up for the Vision Pro. There's already people playing with it. Not actually an immersive experience on the VR Pro, but getting content onto the VR Pro, um, the Vision Pro is already something that you can do in our platforms because we've supported all of the, you know, the formats you would need for that. And obviously there's a bit of buzz around that. We had an amazing artist um, from Korea showing a, a, a short that he made that was fully immersive on the Apple Vision. So they brought one to the booth. P the, art, the customers were able to sit there what he did, and as long as you were sitting down, it was amazing. I wouldn't want to do it on, on standing up because I might have fallen over, but it was very impressive stuff. Um, but we, yeah, we will, you know, we can support all the output devices that people want, be it Unreal or TV or VR or AR. Our, our apps are all set up for that. Amazing. And as you, as you step back sort of and look at the industry in general that, you, you know, sort of that you're a part of, what are the, what are the things that you'll sort of the trends you're seeing and the things that you're kind of excited to see in the future? I think the stuff that excited me, and it's been, it's been like this for all the time, right? I think every time a computer gets faster or more powerful, the artists step up and just take it to another level. And so you can never predict what an artist is going to do with your software. But if you can make the highest quality content available, for, the tools available for them to make something, they will bring it on in ways you've never seen. So whether it was the thing I saw, like I said, on this Vision Pro, or just the way people can, up, you know, if, if you looked at YouTube when it started, it was a, you know, tiny little camera with just this, you know, live feed or whatever. But now, you know, you're, the content creators on YouTube or any of the social platforms are up in their game and making things that would have been TV quality, you know, 10 years ago, film quality, you know, 20 years ago. So it's always about that acceleration of high quality content that keeps me excited. Because if you give the artists the tools and the computers can drive that, then they're going to do something you've never seen before. And that's, I think, where all, everybody at Maxon gets their passion. It's what's kept me in the industry for you know, 26 years now, is that they will always blow by you. And I think that's not going to stop. I to totally agree that some of the YouTube channels that we watch now in you know, full 4K, and they, and they look amazing, and the, the, the CGI things yeah. that they're doing is incredible, right? Like it, 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 it it's, it's of, unbelievable. Um, I mean, or if you just think about TV now versus, I, I assume, when we were kids, you know, you know, yep. Stranger Things now would have been the highest quality budgeted film, you know, that we'd gone to see in the movies, even in 2000, right? And now it's TV content. And that means there's more artists doing this kind of stuff because there's more content desire. And everybody now wants to learn how to use these tools. Um, and so you get lots of new people coming in wanting to learn how do I do that that, way, that I saw in this show or how does this thing work that I saw in that um, episode. So it's, it's, it's really impressive and it's, I'm privileged to be able to just hang out and talk to the artists who make this stuff because 
you know, they just come in and tell you to do something, you're, you know, typing away and you're kind of an engineer and you're, you know, you're working on software and then this amazing thing comes on at the end from somebody else's hands. And it's just, you know, I think that's why everybody at Maxon loves doing what they do. Well, I really appreciate, you know, the focus on artists um, because often we think of these things as highly technical and you, you've got to open these really um, intricate software pieces and it's like you really need to have left brain and right brain going at the same time. But I think it's one of the real strengths of your products is actually getting a lot of that tech out of the way and just making it work for an artist, right? And I think that's why the five companies came together so well because each of them at that root started with either an artist or someone very close to an artist and worked with them to always implement what they needed and how and they, it was this you know tight relationship between the artist and the developer to enable what the artist wanted and it didn't start from a you know complicated workflow it started from what's the easiest way to do something brilliant and each of the companies had that exact same philosophy so when they came together you know the sum was so much greater than the parts because they can then say hey i'm over in redshift but i need this in cinema 4d or zbrush can now be so much better because we're bringing it into cinema 4d and we have the direct connection we can put redshift in zbrush and all of a sudden you get that spectacular rendering in zbrush so they can really build on each other and all that same experience is all artist based so good courtney we've got a quick question that came in from craig can we get to that one yeah, and I, I almost had the same uh, question as Craig McFarlane from Boston, Massachusetts, and he's asking you, how do you navigate the AI impact uh, to give artists more of what they need? And I was going to ask you, uh, AI is the big uh, buzzword this year at uh, NAB, and AI, generative AI has not been very good at creating uh, 3D objects uh, and manipulating, rendering 3D images. It's mainly uh, 2D uh, imagery. Uh, have you guys been looking forward to that, and how do you uh, uh, incorporate the impact of AI into the Maxon product? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm very careful here, right? So we would look at what I would more consider machine learning or, or AI when it can make an artist work faster. But what I absolutely believe in is that generative AI or AI in general is not creativity. Um, you start most of your terminology with like or as or that and what we really want to enable is the artist you know creativity is a human thing right no one else really has it so the artist is going to bring the creativity they're going to be the one with the vision they're going to be the one telling the story and so we want to use the right tools to enable that and if it's machine learning or generative ai there's lots of great ways to enable an artist um, have them do more things faster you know be it you know spectacular rotoscoping or you know maybe changing a material with variation so that you can get a better wood texture. You know, there's great ways to enable artists. Um, but a lot of the buzz out there is that concept that these things are going to replace artists, and we just do not subscribe to that at all. And so for us, it's about where do you find that balance point between make, taking the technology and using it in a way that can enable artists to do their work better, faster, with more impact. Um, but the creativity is always the artist um, involved, and so that we want to just enable that. And so, you know, we, we kind of stay away from the hot trends and buzzes and we focus on what's actually being created right now and trying to make that better and more enabled. Hey, Thanks. David, thank you, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm conscious we want to save your voice for the party tonight. <laughs> exactly. You know, make sure you've got plenty of energy and you're able to get and enjoy a great party. Um, thank you for how you've just shown up and been uh, just an interesting conversation as well, um, not, just, not just also telling us about your great product. So thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Great. All right, we're going to go straight down to Bill, who is with Pixel Scope. Hey, Bill. Outside, outstanding. We are here with pixelcastai.ai, and I'm here with Danny. This caught my eye because look what's happening over my right shoulder. There is live ping pong, and Danny's going to explain to us what's going on with everything. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm just gonna break down what's really happening over here. Uh, so yeah. we have broadcasting cameras and then we have high-speed cameras. Um, so we, the high-speed cameras are all on the truss and we use six of them to track down the balls and use 12 of them to track down the players in real time. I want to say real time for sure. Um, so basically what we track down, we send it over to the server, not a uh, big bulky equipment for streaming, we just send down to one server, that's it. And then within the server, we pretty much reconstruct two 3D coordinates 
and then we feed that 3D coordinates into the AI model. And AI model pretty much decides uh, what's really happening on the court. It just recognizes what the, all the events. So right now they're doing the rallies. It pretty much recognizes they're doing the rallies. And if somebody drops the ball, if somebody's doing the serve, it recognizes those, those events and then controlling this PTZ controllable robotic ass automatically. There's no cameraman standing behind. As they move, it's gonna move. So thanks to MRMC, uh, we have all the APIs open with them. Uh, we're controlling their robotic has, and we're controlling the broadcasting camera at the same time. So basically what we wanna do is support the broadcasting with using AI. Uh, wherever the people cannot go or wherever the cameraman cannot go, we want to support them. Um, if there, if it's a sports lower tiers or if it's, a, if it's a sports with lack of money for doing the broadcasting, we could be there without any cameraman fully automated. But if there's a cameraman, we want to support them. That's what we want to do with the Pixelcast. Wow. wow. That was big. This that was a lot, yes. It it's a lot. It's it's super cool. I think part of the problem is that the players are too good, and that they weren't they weren't dropping balls, and so <laughs> we're seeing seeing what's going on there. But um, so that so there's there's tracking of going on. There's tracking of the ball. There's right and at super high speed, right? Because the ball moves so right. quick. Right. Um, and right. then and, and and then as the players are moving out, then there's the tracking um, of the camera moving and following that. Um, right, exactly. Where the, the AI is coming in, I mean, we don't traditionally think of, of um, AI in tracking as much as, uh, I guess it's sort of um, um, uh, predicting a little of what might be happening next and, and kind of looking into the view. Is that the type of thing? Exactly. So data that we fit into the AI model, that's what is what the AI is using to predict and then see what will happen next. I don't know how it learns, but it will learn. It learned, and then now we have a disservice. Um, so if you come a little bit over here, by looking at this monitor over here, uh -huh. it shows that in real time we're tracking players that is playing on the court. Right now we have two players coming from AAA Table Tennis Club um, in San Francisco, thanks to two Bay brothers. Um, they're on the screen right over here and they're playing over here in four different kind of views. We, sh we showed it as an example uh, with, with the rectangular bars. It is in real time tracking right now. And as they play ball over here, with a rainbow square, we track them down in real time. You can see how fast it is. Oh, wow. um, look at the sound, look at how they play, and look at the monitor. It is in real time. It is under millisecond real time. We have to have those data to move those cameras because it is real time live streaming that we have to have as a service. And now is that a, is that a special ball in any way? More reflective Nothing. or anything? No. Not at all. Wow. They can change the ball right now. They drop it every single time and they pick up the new one from their pockets. Nothing new. Nothing new. Amazing. Nothing new technology on the balls. Just, a, yeah, just yeah. with the visual. That's cool. I'm in Wellington, New, uh, New Zealand. We've got Adrian's got a question. Hey, Danny. Thanks for having us. Hey, um, you've got two players on deck there. Um, I deal with a sport called netball down here, which is similar to basketball. How would you cope with, say, 14 players on a, on a big court at one time? Would you have multiple cameras? And, you know, what's, what sort of... How could you scale that one? Oh, right now we have a broadcasting for table tennis, but we have already done the data analytics with the volleyballs. Uh, we had the same kind of setup on, the, on top of the ceiling. Uh, it's just a more number. Right now we use a total of 18 uh, high-speed cameras, but for the volleyball, we use 24 of them. So on the ceiling, we have those high-speed cameras. We track them down um, as they mingle each other and as they track this, um, go walk away. We don't lose any tracking system because we have a 360 views around the court. Um, so we, as you said, um, you mentioned about the basketball, we would have a similar setup having those homography view around the court. And in that case, we would not miss the ball. I mean, the basketball is much bigger than the ta table tennis ball, so there's yep. no way we're going to lose them, right? So it's going to be the same concept, um, similar concept with the basketball as well. That's very cool. Um, I will probably hit you up after this. <laughs> yeah, it is good. So... So what about uh, statistics gathering and things like that? And, and I mean, potentially auto scoring and all of that. 
Okay, uh, for the statistics, um, we have to have an umpire uh, for, because it's a traditional kind of a table tennis and they don't want to, they need to have an umpire. So we uh, integrated with the uh, scoreboard that the umpires do and then we get the score. But then with, even without it, we're able to do it because we're doing all the data analysts. I mean, we need those data to do the broadcasting. I mean, it's got to be really accurate. So with the data analysts, we are able to do all the bounce points and then we're able to distinguish if it was an attack, if it was a serve, or if it was just a missed serve. All those data analytics we are able to do. And it is done real time. Uh, once again, I'm just saying this over and over again. Because from this demonstration, I want people to take away two words, real time and automatic. Those two words, um, they can take away from these demonstrations. That's great. Uh, Courtney, we've got a couple of questions there. We've just got a couple of minutes. Okay, uh, let's go to one of the questions from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. He says, may we see the multi-view to see the quality of the tracking, which got a little geek out a second ago. The multi-view monitor. Hmm. Right, so it's yeah. a multi-system over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a multi-system over here. So even change the views between the cameras for the streaming. So either they want to use a camera one or camera three. I don't decide that. It's just an AI deciding depending on the data, uh, which player which player is at which position, depending all those um, data points and the event that is about to happen or that is happening. Um, it just decides which camera to use and it gives the multi-view system. And is the AI smart enough to know when a, a player misses a shot to cut to a close-up of their face to see the disappointment on their face? <laughs> well, well, we that's, that's part of broadcasting. Like if it's a disappointment, disappointment they have on their face, it's, 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 it's going to be on the stream. I'm sorry, but it's part of the broadcasting. So, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank thank you so much, Danny. That was mind blowing. We never know what we're gonna what we're gonna see, and that was really cool. It's cool to have a live demo like that as well. So, thank thank you so much. Thank you. We still have one more day, so you're welcome to just come by. It's just thank you. Excellent. That's great. All right, we're gonna move off to um, a very friend a friend of office hours now is Electrosonics, and we've got Alex. Hey, Alex. Hey everybody, uh, we are here at Electrosonic. I'm here with Carl Winkler. And, uh, Great to see you, Alex. So good to see you again. And uh, you've got a couple new products here, a couple updates, a couple new products, um, ones that, are, that can get a little wet. Yes, indeed. So the new DSSM, this is the digital successor to the SSM microtransmitter. This one's IP57 rated. And what does that mean? That means that it can be underwater for 30 minutes or more at a meter. So it's pretty serious water protection. And, and, where, and who uses that? Really anyone, uh, but it's especially important if you think you might get wet in the scene, right. like uh, a lot of reality so surfing, television. reality surfing, television, yep. Uh, any theater productions, anything where it might be in the rain, right. poolside, uh, in a boat. And how uh, long again? 30 minutes at a yeah. meter or more. But see, we've got this one over here. This has been three days now in this fishbowl. And uh, we've lost the microphones a couple times, <laughs> but the transmitter itself it's still, is, we're going, is we still see, going still great. see the display. Yeah. I actually listened to it a little earlier, and you can still hear the microphone through here. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty slick little system. And, and yeah. is this, is it, when is this shipping? Q3. Now, what does it yeah. take to get to something that is able to do this level of waterproofing? A lot of time and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, Is there anything you, you had to change specifically to make that work? Well, one of the things we changed was we had to get connectors that themselves would be watertight. Right. And in the process of designing it, the housing was changed a couple times to make sure that it could be sealed and be reliable. Uh, and Now, are the batteries the same, or do you have to restructure them? Yeah, the batteries are the same as we had for the SSM in the first place. It's a right. rechargeable lithium-ion pack. Uh -huh. And uh, we have a drop-in charging uh, with optional chargers, as well as you can take the battery out right. and charge it in an individual charger. So you can, you so can have a whole bunch of them all, all um, there. So, yeah, so. Exactly. So let, let's go ahead and go around here. We got some sure. software here. Sure enough. So this is, so explain how all of this works. Great. So we have a, a software package called Wireless Designer. It's available downloadable from our website. And it's, it allows you to connect to uh, a wide variety of devices from receivers uh, to uh, 
IFB transmitters, IEM transmitters, and do monitoring. We're, we're looking at all the channels now. We see the active channels, including the watertight unit there. Right. Uh, so the big addition for the show, though, is the ability to create and edit uh, frequency lists, and each one's got a name for the entry. So like in, in a reality TV setting, as an example, you might have a cast of 12 people in a particular right. scene. So it allows the mixer on a portable receiver to dial through those by name, not right. having to keep track of the frequencies. Right. So you can create the list here, edit it here, update it, and then share it with the hardware, right. and then even move it between hardware. Using and, so, and we'll see the names yeah. down in here. That's right, you'll see the names right. next to the channels. Right. So it's a much more user-friendly and quick way to dial into the talent channels. Absolutely, yeah. and is this released now? Uh, not yet, this is in beta. We're showing it here, getting a little bit of input. Yep. It'll be released probably within a month as version 2.1. What kind of input do you get? Uh, people ask for you know little tweaks here and there, like right. have you thought about this, have you thought about that? And sometimes right. we have, sometimes we haven't. So right. uh, we had our programmer here yesterday talking to customers directly and getting that feedback, right. and he's going to take it back and uh, do a few more tweaks, then we'll release it. Right, no, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's walk around a little bit. I think uh, sure. for other people who haven't, haven't seen all the electrosonic stuff, sure. um, we'll, we'll follow around here. Let's take a look here. These are all the latest digital products, right. including the watertight that you saw already in the fishbowl. Right. Uh, these are our portable receivers. I would say the most popular of those now is the four channel slot. Right. So this is a very small receiver capable of fitting into the super slot ecosystem, right. which there's now tons explain, of stuff out explain there. Explain the super yeah. slot ecosystem. Well, it started out as video cameras would have a slot. They called it Unislot back then. Right. And it allowed you to dock your receiver in the camera and it would power it and get the audio. Right. So they didn't have anything external to the camera. Mm -hmm. Well, this has evolved into an ecosystem of its own and the super slot means that there's also a data connection. Right. So I can now put this in certain kinds of docks. The docks can read the information and I can use, like, let's say, a mixer to right. program this instead of having to do it on the unit itself. Because a lot of us are with the smaller ones where, you know, we're getting good at the little buttons. Right, the tiny buttons, and I mean, right. it's a rich display, it's a color display, uh, and very well organized, but you know, if you can get a bigger display onto it, like Wireless Designer, with this is, uh, you can connect it with that, or like I say, a mixer recorder that right. has the super slot type data interface. Now I have a hard question for you. Okay. We see mics that have three prongs, four prong, you know, so there's the, yeah. you've got the TRS, you've got the Sure has four, you guys have five. Yep. What's the difference? Why do, why, do, why do they have to be different ones? Is it just the, that you picked that, or is there a, a reason yeah, for it? Yeah, we, we all picked it at you know, earlier times in our, in our development. Right. Ours is five pin, and part of the and reason- And what do you get with yeah. the five pins? What, did, what you get is that there's a, a ground pin, right. there's an audio pin, right. uh, there's two audio pins. There's a mic level pin and a line level pin separate, huh. and then there's a bias pin and a bias selector pin. And what so do those do? Different t types of mics might take a different bias voltage, and so it can be customized. And so the five pin gives you a lot of flexibility, and right. it's a connector you can probably solder yourself if you're halfway decent. Right. Now, if you want stuff to get smaller, like our new transmitter, you're gonna go with that three pin micro connector. Right. And to do that though, instead now, is, of- And is this yeah. your three pin or is this a standardized three pin? Industry standard three pin. Okay. Almost everyone now is using this on mm -hmm. something or other. Right. Okay. And then we've got a menu that, that allows you to customize how that input is being wired. There's some presets in there, like a right. DPA, Sankin Cause 11, and so on, dynamic mic, line input, instrument input with a high impedance. Right. And then here's custom. You can right. set it yourself. So that all has to do with how it's wired right. to get the best sound possible. I'm just jumping to see if we have any. If you have any questions there, uh, uh, let us know. You can go ahead and throw those in at asknab.live. And uh, we've got one from, we've actually got a question from Mickey Makachor okay. uh, in the Philippines. And he, and Mickey uh, asks, um, fully remote controllable digital mic wireless when please. I understand. And don't have a concrete answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, do you, some other things you want to show us? You've got uh, the IFBs, so yeah. that's the other, the other direction. We do have IFBs and uh, there's a number of different ways to look at that stuff.
You know, kind of the classic for many years was the IFBR1A, right. which is discontinued, can't get the parts to make that anymore. But we have the IFBR1B, which is half the size, very lightweight, yep. also uses that same rechargeable battery from the SSM and the new DSSM, yep. and also tray chargeable or drop-in chargeable yep. for studios. The charger does the batteries or the units. Uh, we've also got the Super Deluxe, the digital uh, stereo IFB system. And, and what is the stereo one used for? for? Is this mostly for artists? Uh, it's used a lot by artists. Uh, the Foo Fighters is touring with this system as an example. Right. But in a lot of uh, production environments, you want your boom operator to have the most clean feed possible. So right. they don't necessarily need stereo, but what they need is a very low noise, very clean right. digital uh, foldback so they can hear where they're aiming the mic or if there's any background noise. Right. And this system delivers that. It can be used in mono or stereo. Mm -hmm. And in a studio environment, one advantage is with the good separation between audio channels, right. because it's digital, you can actually have one RF carrier and two mono feeds that don't talk to each other at all with no crosstalk. Right. So I can be picking up only one of these feeds with this receiver. Right. Meanwhile, you're saving half the number of carriers. So it's a powerful system. Douglas Carmichael asks, um, have you had success with your wireless in the live sound market? Uh, yes, some. Uh, we're certainly on Broadway theatricals. We're on some tours. Right. Uh, there's some major artists actually using it. What is the What is the core of your business? What would you say is the largest segment of your business? I would say it's uh, probably location sound, yep, like yep. production sound. Next would be mm -hmm. broadcast, and after that would be live sound and theatrical. And and you have a couple of them over here. Yeah. So this is all part of that digital system. This is a portable digital stereo transmitter. Right. And it's a unique product, and so this is actually out with artists right now as part of what's called an ambient return system. Uh -huh. It's in-ears uh, that have uh, lav mics that are transmitted to the monitor engineer by this unit. Right. The monitor engineer can then uh, fade that sort of binaural feed back to the artist to right. give them a sense of where they are on the stage and the audience reaction. Yeah. So it's kind of a niche product, it's very interesting, but it's part of this ecosystem. And then we've also got a low-cost IFB here, the IF Blue and, brand. And we've been using we've been using these, yeah. and we really like them. Double A powered. Yep. It's also drop-in chargeable. Yep. And uh, yeah, very popular uh, units. So, question for you: uh, What do you recommend as far as batteries for these? Because they chew up batteries. And yep. what do you recommend as, do you ever re recommend the rechargeable batteries? Absolutely, in fact, uh, we include a couple rechargeables with these. Right. Um, and then of course, lithiums will let them run forever. Right. Um, alkalines will give you good battery life, but generally good rechargeables are better than that. So, right, right, right. you know, we see the world going towards rechargeables and the quality of those has gone way up in the past 10 years. So, right. uh, we feel like that's probably the most common battery that's used in these now. And then for the other ones that, you're, that, that we have, now you have, do you, you also have like a little insert, right? Yeah, our own uh, LB50 battery pack. Right. Which is like this one here. Mm -hmm. That's a lithium ion pack. Yep. And uh, this is going to run this unit eight hours. Wow. And it's part of the whole ecosystem here, as I said, with you can charge the batteries or the unit in the charging dock. Right. So, yeah. That's great. Carl, thank you so much for your time. Always great to, to chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're going to, basically, we're going to throw it back to you guys. Um, so, uh, Grant, uh, we're throwing it back to you, and uh, we're going to sign off from the live show today. So, um, so thanks so much for everybody, and go ahead and take it away, Grant. Great. Thanks, Alex. Amazing to see Electrosonics and what they're doing there and how we're, uh, how we're using some of those and IFBs and, and uh, some of the mics and stuff. And, and Waterproof was super cool. It was a great question by Alex. It feels like he was like, like really hammering in and saying, well, what did you have to do? What did you, how did you make it waterproof? You know, what was it? It's not, it's not just tightening the screws. It's actually making it waterproof. Like you've got to do more to it than that. So, um, Courtney, what did you what did you take of that? And it, I mean, you've done location sound since oh, um, yeah. since since location sound was thought of. Since everyone um, was in diapers here, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> started exactly. in the in the seventies, <laughs> yeah, back in seventy one. So uh, right. yeah, I've always I've always been thrilled with Electrosonics uh, stuff. It's it's so compact and it's it's 
you know, leading technology and they really listen to the sound mixers out there. And, and when you come to them with a problem, uh, they will try and handle it. And I've known a lot of their people over the years, Gordon, uh, and all the originators of it who are now retired. They've been in the business that long. So, uh, that they've been great. And now that they have these, uh, the waterproof ones or water resistant, which I guess they can say right. waterproof, but if you're going to dive in the pool with them, this has always been a problem. It's always been a problem with me because uh, you'll have a scene and the director will go, okay, at the end of this scene, uh, the boat sinks and everybody dives in the water and you're going, but we're on wireless mics. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe just uh, work it out. You got to yeah, watch. Yeah, you what's your budget? Yeah, what's your budget? We have to have four <laughs> replaceables after each would it one be for right? each take. Yes. Would it be all right if the actors throw their mics just as they're jumping in the water? <laughs> just okay? as they're sinking in. <laughs> and this caused me, during Roar, this caused me to have to ride inside a boat with two 650-pound Bengal tigers and handhold a microphone into the Nagra because we couldn't use wireless. <laughs> because of the fact that the actors at the end, the boat crashes and they jump off the boat and swim away. And I'm stuck wow. in the boat with a tiger. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Ronnie, what have, what have you been your highlights from today? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. You're really muted. Oh, you can't unmute. All right, there you go. Well, you, 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 yeah, I can't. It I can't like left hand I speechless. Didn't, I didn't find my mouse. <laughs> okay. It left me speechless. Uh, so we used uh, Electrosonics uh, uh, last year also uh, during uh, NAB. And what, what actually hits me from, from Electrosonics, it's, um, it's kind of fully automatic works all the time. So I can't remember even one, single time we had a dropout on those uh, electrosonics that we used so um, the, the thing that um, really inspires me is that they actually are able to make something using rf that just works and that amazes me i've been doing radio frequency stuff for my most of my entire adult life and there's always something that fails uh, using RF. But these electrosonics, they are, they are just cutting through everything. And they also sound uh, awesome. And that's, uh, that's really amazing for me to, to see that uh, a vendor can actually uphold so high quality and, and those high standards and continue to innovate because that's what they are doing all the time. So it's really impressive. Um, yeah. Uh, that's electrosonics. Let me think about all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, and speaking about RF cutting through and it just working, um, the VizLink again is super impressive. I mean, you probably couldn't find a harder um, environment, um, a more difficult, you know, RF rich environment <laughs> um, as uh, as on the NAB floor. And, uh, and you know, we've seen a couple of little a little dropouts here and there and it sounds like there was a bit of a, a overheating issue yesterday um so it'll be it'll be interesting to sort of diagnose that and how it is that 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 that, that came about and if that was a mounting thing or something else drawing power or whatever it is but you know it's the sort of things that we um will enjoy thinking about that as a an opportunity for us uh, rather than a, a bad thing but um guy what have what have been some of your highlights today well, um, reading about Ross with their 30 NDI input switcher called the uh, Ross Carbonite Code was something new. Uh, then a little bit more on the VizRT stuff, you know, I'd like to see the pricing because, you know, we're kind of building our own in vMix and it does everything that I needed to do. So I, I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. And I'm sure Jeff Keithley will be one of those guys that, that'll love to show us <laughs> what, what we're missing. So uh, I'm anxious to see, you know, cost for performance, what uh, mm -hmm. what capabilities we can offer other clients and and be able to step up to the to the big leagues or just buy my own with Ross Carbonite code if that's the case, you know, what makes sense, you know. So it, this is the great thing about these shows is being able to see the new cameras, you know, hold off on lenses or whatever it is that you're looking at until after the show. So there's a lot of decisions to be made. You know, it's just like even the electro mm -hmm. stuff, you're just like, okay, do I buy used stuff because I can buy more of them or do I buy the newest, latest and greatest thing because it's some new, uh, you know, capability that, 
that I have to have, you know, like waterproof or, you know, any of these uh, longer ranges yeah. or the in-ears, the M2Ts that we use in that studio tour. Uh, those mm. blow my mind, the clarity of them too. So yeah, those are a few of the things. Yeah. You know, it, as we've been going around and, and hearing from the different booths, it, it sort of reminded me that um, the purpose of of that that the time the calendar um, you know the date on the calendar that forces these vendors to have something to announce and sometimes they don't they're not actually releasing a product but they're just saying this is coming later this year um, and what we just heard from Electrosonics is it's like here's a bunch of beta software that we've got and now we're hearing from our customers and they're giving feedback before it even is launched um, you know and I, I was also thinking about sitting down with David before having a great conversation, you know, with a CEO of a big company, you know, it's a multinational, you know, 350 something employees. Um, and he, and he just was having a chat with us. It's pretty amazing. I think there is something about, um, people coming together, doing that stuff on site and us making it available for everyone else, um, including ourselves, as we've gotten to ask people. That's what I'm kind of being blown away from. Well, it's about. kind of funny too, because being out here, we can actually Google stuff super fast because, you know, yeah. Jonas is on his phone, like trying to dial this stuff in and we're just like, so we can actually intercept a lot of this news and then throw it back. That's how I was able to, you know, look at what Maxon was doing with their website because uh, right. their YouTube was just popping up on the radar, you know, of, mm -hmm. across searching uh, YouTube for NAB, what's going on and Twitter. So those guys are mm -hmm. super powerful. And it's it's interesting that we're able to do this blend of on-site uh, and then in the yeah. cloud, but with multiple brains. And then the feedback from Mukana well, with having the viewers shape the show as well. So it's like a three-tiered approach here. It's really cool. It really is. And we want to thank live view as well, um, who, who have actually um, helped us make that other link work, you know, that, we, that we've had. Um, so we, we saw Jonas. It was so cool, the different people that we've had, right? It was perfect. Um, Clearly, people have been thinking about it um, and uh, about who to have there. And so, Jonas was kind of going toe to toe um, with the VizRT guys. You know, he really knows what he's talking about when it comes to cloud and and uh, uh, doing cloud production and asking all the right questions. Um, and the live view was working great there. And that's totally over in another hall. Um, I, I wish while they were there, we would have spun around. We could have seen the Black Magic booth and the Ross booth. Um, but there's so much. I mean, it's endless, right? We could we could walk around the whole booths all the time. But um, there's maybe always sometime. tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. Yeah. There's always tomorrow. There you go. <laughs> Me to it. Yeah. Now, I yeah, haven't looked right. at the schedule yet, but I'm hoping that maybe they're in the central hall. Sound devices, you know, who we uh, mm -hmm. depend on a lot of times for a lot of our equipment. Uh, with the mixed pre's and everything, if uh, we could get by their booth. I don't think they're announcing anything new other than their Astral uh, wireless systems, uh, which they introduced earlier or this year or actually the end of last year. But it's amazing that they have a, uh, it's awfully pricey, but a, a single 1RU unit that has, you know, 16, was it 16 receivers, separate channels of, of wireless mm. reception and a 1RU. Wow. And, it, and it's just a software update from 8 to 16. So, uh, of course, the hardware is capable of doing 16 out the back. If you can't afford 16, you pay for eight. And later on, you just get a little key from them and it unlocks the other room. So that's pretty nice. <laughs> that is very cool. Yeah, well, uh, look, the, it's a it's a hard uh, a hard thing to filter through is who, who are we going to look at. Um, I think that the Pixel Scope is a great example of a booth that I'd never heard of didn't know what was going on and it's just that the guys on the on site were like this is cool you know like the the table tennis court caught their attention and was like y you've got to see this um and that's the sort of stuff that we we don't find online to your point guys like it, it's not necessarily popping up in feeds or or things but when you walk around you find these um vendors that are doing something super cool um and we could be using that our our community could be uh hitting them up and doing something with that, you know. And Mickey just whispered in my ear that I got it wrong. It's not 16, it's 32 channels in a 1RU for the Astral. <laughs> of course, it's about, I don't know, $27,000 for that receiver. So it's so pricey. Duh. Wow. 32 but channels in 1RU of rack. Price, I was going to say, price per, channel. Shows. price per <laughs> channel is pretty good though, right? 
That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, and, call, oh, yeah, 32, yeah. And you have to yeah. unlock them in, in groups of eight. Oh, well, yeah. Just keep doing it. And, and, what, and then you can, uh, it records, obviously, but then could you pump that out um, on, on Dante or something? As it well? comes out on Dante. I believe uh, it, it all interfaces with Dante, 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 Dante. You say Dante, I say Dante, Dante. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so it, it uh, you can get, the, I think, the full 32 channels uh, over Dante. So it's easy. No wiring mess out of the back of it, you know, just like one or two cables plug it into the back of that and gives you up to 32 receivers. Uh, Very nice. And you can monitor each one because it had the LCD panel in the front just kind of keeps du- jumping up in the banks of eight. And you can look at the status of the batteries and the RF signal strength and the audio level on each one of those 32 transmitters on a single RU unit. So, uh, Very cool. Massive changes. Yeah. We are, we, we uh, were scheduled to finish soon and... That may happen, but I just wanted to let you know that, you know, we're, we're just checking because we've been enjoying this so much. We're just sort of checking if the field are able to do uh, a, a little bit more. So we're just in a holding pattern at the moment um, just to see if that's going to be possible. We're, we're sort of pushing them. Um, but I want to thank uh, Zoom again. We started the show with Andy, which was awesome. I'm, I'm still glowing from, uh, from seeing tiles, that the, the, new, the new application for doing the gallery view and having full control over that. Um, wow. The, the funny thing with that is I was really thinking that Unreal Engine was where I was going to need to go to be able to do some of those things, um, which is, you know, kind of taking a sledgehammer to a nail. Um, and so I think that uh, what we can do, and that obviously I, I want to dive into that a bit more with Andy, is like, you know, how is it that you, that you came to see this as a, as a key product um, to add into the market, because I can totally see it using on on events, definitely on as he said in this sort of hybrid events. We might be bringing in a few people or bringing a panel or something into a into a live event. You can you can now show all that nicely, um, and so that that's a awesome product. That's just one of the announcements that Zoom made. They have also, uh, they've, they've got a form that you can go to. And so you can go to officehours.global slash Zoom um, and you can also zap this QR code as well. Um, and that will get you uh, on a list that's going to keep pushing those updates out. Particularly if you if you didn't hear about tiles or see that little demo, make sure that when the show's finished, go back to, right to the start of the show of this day three and take a look at the demo that Andy did. It's 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 definitely worth seeing. The thing is too that uh, if you go to that form and fill it in, then when Tiles is released, um, then you'll be kind of first to know about it uh, and be able to start using that. Um, Guy, what were you thinking of Tiles when you saw that? <laughs> so, similar to me? I want to fill them. I want to fill all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all of the Tiles. <laughs> <laughs> Want to do our own version of office hours? <laughs> yes, just with dials. Yeah, it looked pretty great. It I just very, picked very up the cool. schedule, and those, those of you who are interested in Dante Dante uh, <laughs> Audio Interconnects, uh, Audinate is our first guest tomorrow in the booth. So uh, we look forward to seeing them and and gathering all of our questions over Audinate and Dante should... and how how the pervasive they've become into the market. All the panelists should try to pull out as as many of their products as we can. Uh, all the all the little adapters, and you know, we're going to count how many Dante devices we have in each one of our homes. I can um, feel all my, uh, my my shelves behind me. Yeah. So just uh, just to <laughs> kind of fill up, and you won't be able to see any of the other stuff. We have so much Dante equipment, even right. uh, even the extra cards for sound mixers. And, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a pie. Well, yeah, we've got a whole a whole other day to come, and uh, and so it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Adrian, got some thoughts about today and and uh, tomorrow? It's um, the Pixel Scope was incredibly interesting because we've actually built an AI based solution for doing stats for the netball. So we've got lots of cameras around and tracking like that, and it's like it's basically the solution that we wanted five years ago and obviously not AV related directly but um, something that we could absolutely use so yeah I was that was I was like oh yeah <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah yeah and what was amazing they were using 
they were using uh, just regular uh, normal light cameras and not infrared or any kind of tracking markers on that ball to do that stuff in real time, especially exactly. with a sport as fast as ping pong is, you know, yeah. following that ball with just, just regular visual cameras is pretty amazing to triangulate on the ball, track it in 3D space. It's hard. I wonder yeah. if they are doing actually true uh, volumetric video processing in that uh, uh, AI. Um, it's something in there that makes me believe that they actually are. Um, I don't. I'm not sure how. Did they say how how the big the resolution was? But anyway, if they are actually doing three D volumetric, mm. yeah. So if it's kind of three D volumetric video that is being fed into the AI and. Based on that, it does the the, the decisions. It's really advanced. It's, yeah, it's he said he definitely said something about it going back into a three D, um, creating a three D environment, um, so that it was able to track it in three D space. Um, and so it sounds like it's stitching it together, um, which would be a better way of doing it, right? Rather than trying to send it three D data um, and make it work on it, it's it's potentially just taking the the that sort of uh, kind of look like a comet or something on the the view that you could see the ball sort a of tracer a tracer ball yeah <laughs> a tracer yeah that's right yeah yeah it's like the mouse the mouse cursor with the with the um what, what was that well what the was networks that did that with tails. hockey like, years ago with a yeah, puck follower you know a little right. put a red comet tail on the hockey puck so you could see it on the white yeah. ice easily yeah you know. So it would make sense then that it's passing that data in rather than all of the video data and trying to work it out. Work it out. Um, I wanted to ask him what the speed and whether it was tracking speed, um, which I, I assume it would be able to. You know, you would think that it, it, it knows it, if it knows it in three D space, then it knows it how how fast it's going over time. That grand slam was four hundred and twenty miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't think a ping pong ball can go. So, um, so we're looking forward to tomorrow. Um, we, we are going to give all our, our crew a break and, and keep to the scheduled time. Um, they've done an, an, an epic job. Um, we're looking forward to seeing a little bit more of the booth where hopefully we can twist Alex's arm to give us a bit of a tour tomorrow before they, uh, before they start ripping it all down. Um, that'll be super cool. So hopefully we can spend a bit of time there and just see that. Uh, as well as we want to see a few more booths and maybe we get a, a live view into the um, uh, into Central Hall again and Black Magic. Even we just walk around the Black Magic booth and the Ross booth and and sound devices. I mean, <laughs> the list could go on, right? I think what we're proving is that this is working really well and that we can probably extend it. Um, at least me sitting on a chair at home is saying, how about we extend the show? <laughs> the guys on the floor might have a different idea, yeah. but um, we thank all the crew. There's a back-end crew that are switching um, all around the world. They're managing questions. They're, they're, um, they're doing liaison to us. There's, there's Brian that's looking after us and making sure we know what's going on. Um, there's a huge team. Uh, and we'll, we'll do a bit more of a breakdown of that uh, tomorrow as we, as we think. And of course, we always do a debrief on office hours as well. And we really start to pull apart how we made it all work. So we're looking forward uh, to having you join us again tomorrow. Make sure you chat to us in the chat and ask us uh, lots of questions and things like that. And we want to thank Zoom again for being our connection partner. We couldn't do any of this um, without having great bandwidth there at the booth. So thank you so much. All right, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye -bye. And reminder, 10 o'clock tomorrow, starting early. So uh, early. don't miss it. <laughs> if you tune in at 12, it'll all be over. So 10 o'clock. <laughs> 10 a.m. Pacific. Pacific. <laughs> That's Pacific we'll time. Then. Pacific yes. time for all you globalers out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get Thanks, me a everyone. few of those Nisi... Uh...